Hi everyone, uh, good evening. Um, thanks very much indeed for uh, joining us for our fantastically named um, evening of entertainment, Clout Atlas. Um, I want to thank George Severus, who is one of the um, fellows here at the Tau Centre who has arranged all of this. He is uh, leading our track of research on, on um, influencers. Uh, and he thought up Clout Atlas. I don't want anyone to think that was my idea. Um, he's also a, a comedian. I mean, a genuinely a comedian, so you should catch one of his shows. Um, my name's Emily Bell. I'm director of the Tower Centre. Uh, you're in the Brown Institute for Media Innovation. Um, and we're very uh, grateful to our colleagues uh, for hosting us here in this lovely space. Um, we've got quite a kind of a, a, a packed programme. Um, there are refreshments that will be unleashed at about 7.30, 7.45 when we're done. Um, there's also water at the back if, if, if you need to refresh yourselves. Um, and the restrooms are in what we call the uh, first floor, which is actually the basement, um, but we're all about um, self-media and uh, making our brand look slightly more flashy than we are. So if you go to the basement, if you need the, if you need the bathroom, go to the basement. Um, why are we doing, why do influencers at a uh, journalism school? Um, well, uh, obviously, as you know, the business model for journalism has been completely upended. I do a whole session with my students about, or I used to do a whole session about George Takei's Facebook feed, uh, where I get them to um, look at what he's sharing and when he's sharing it, and gradually they understand that, oh, hang on a second, he posts every hour on the hour. Hang on a second, what are these brands that... But the stories are kind of quite good. How is this... Why is this all happening now? So I think that um, something that we've thought of as a, as a phenomenon which is adjacent to or distant from journalism is actually sort of moving closer to how we uh, distribute news and how we share it uh, and it's really having a significant impact on our business model. So we're going to unpack all of that uh, tonight. We have three amazing panellists, pa not, not three amazing panellists, we have more than that, we have three amazing panels, uh, so um, about 12 amazing panellists. Uh, and as I say, we will have short breaks in between each panel, which will run for about 45 minutes. Um, and in those five to 10 minute breaks, you can find your way to the basement or over to the water at the back, and then we'll feed you at the end. With that, I want to hand over to uh, George for our first panel. Thank you. All right, hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming. I'm George, I'm a research fellow at Tau. I'm gonna just invite uh, Shireen, Taylor, and Brooke on stage and then we'll, we'll go down the line and everyone will introduce themselves. Um, so we're, we'll kind of get into the weeds of um, specifics about how digital influencers are affecting you know, the business world and journalism later on, but I wanted to start out this panel with really super broad and general stuff, like what are influencers and where uh, did they come from? So I'm gonna kind of go down the line first and have everyone just introduce themselves, say what they do and uh, Talk a little bit about what got you interested in influencers as a topic. Great, thank you. Um, I am Brooke Duffy. I'm an assistant professor of communication at Cornell University. And to me, um, I got interested in the, this whole topic way back when, when I was working on my dissertation. Um, way back when means 2010. And I was studying how the women's magazine industry was evolving in the age of digital and social media. And I kept hearing about the, the impact of, of fashion bloggers. And you know, I thought this was really interesting because there wasn't a lot of research on it, but um, you know, hearing from, from journalists about how their industry is being reconfigured by the like economy and terms like engagement and, and so on and so forth. And so um, when I started this research project, and it was for a book that came out last year, I was struck by how many young people saw fashion blogging and then what kind of evolved into influencing and, and now what we kind of call content creation. How people were seeing these pseudo careers as um, creative, fun, exciting, engaging, but at the same time these narratives were concealing the work that Instagram content creators actually do as part of this. And so um, I come at this from seeing this work, which I think we have this kind of idea in the popular imagination that, oh, influencers, um, 
you know, they're just out there like posting stuff and, you know, fluffy and silly and um, they're not really doing anything. And, and I challenge these narratives by showing the amount of time, energy and investment that it actually takes to work in this field. I see this very much aligned with um, traditional industries, including journalism and, and media work. Um, uh, my name is Taylor Lorenz, and um, I'm a reporter at The Atlantic, and I cover um, internet culture and a lot of influencer um, stuff. Uh, I have, what was the question, how did we, or? Um, sorry, how, when, how did you become interested in influencers, oh. and, and how have influencers kind of affected your work? Yeah, um, I guess I started becoming interested in influencers um, and I used to work in the advertising industry and um, we had a lot of like at the time I, we called them like brand ambassador um, type of people um, who had sort of like were garnering online fame. Um, I got those jobs because I made a bunch of really popular tumblers at the time back in the day. And um, so I was like a, a tumblr influencer for whatever that counted for in 2009. You could have like 10 followers. Um, but anyway, um, so I just became really interested in sort of like the mechanics of online fame and also how that was like how that like how these platforms were sort of letting people um, grow an audience like so much of um, sort of I guess the influencer world is obviously tied to the rise of social media. So YouTube, Vine, Tumblr, less so, but really Instagram. And um, so, yeah, I started writing about it um, since then. And it's just been sort of an interesting um, thing that, that I've been following, so that, that's that. No, <laughs> um, cool. Hi, I'm Shreen Fatik. Um, I'm the Managing Director at edit, of Editorial Products at Digiday Media. Um, so I actually, I've never worked as an influencer, although I wish I had the chops to work as an influencer, so I agree with what you were saying about the immense amount of work it takes to become one. But um, I first became interested in influencer marketing um, about four years ago because one of the big stories that we've sort of told as reporters at Digiday has been about kind of the rise of Facebook and Google as, um, as companies that affect kind of life and culture, but you know, money um, in their own right. And one of the things we kept noticing over and over was that as Facebook and Google kept growing, they were kind of leading to these ecosystems being born. And one of the most interesting ecosystems to me was this rise of these people who would seemingly come out of nowhere and um, had at the time sort of, I think the term of nano influencer wasn't yet <laughs> discovered, but at the time had, you know, hundreds of, hundreds of thousands and millions of followers. And so the reason I actually became interested in it was because we have a series called Confessions, which is where we talk to people in the industry anonymously um, because oftentimes we want them to say things that they can't say for fear of losing their job. So I got on the phone with somebody who worked at a very, very big car manufacturer in the marketing department and he had just spent the majority of his marketing budget um, that quarter on influencer marketing for the first time. And I was like, why did you do that? This seems crazy. And he did, um, he ha was amazing and he has had some great anecdotes about how this whole thing actually came about. And that was, I think, one of, once we wrote that story, I think we had like the biggest traffic day we'd ever had in the history of Digitex. And then I realized that people were really interested in this world and I think it was affecting kind of culture in a very real way and people's jobs in a very real way. And it was affecting, I think, all of our industries from journalism to media and marketing, so. Right onto it. So we kind of touched on this a little bit, but uh, just a very basic question before we get into more complex stuff. How would you define a digital influencer as something different than a media figure or a celebrity? What, what sets them apart within the culture? Um, well, I would define it as, as it's funny, I was just, I'm writing a piece on how to define the word influencer right now, and everyone has totally different uh, definitions of it. I, I think it is sort of like we used to call them like digital celebrities, but I do think it's usually somebody that's um, like has a certain amount of online clout, and that could be within a very small community or usually like a pretty large community, um, but somebody that's like native to social platforms um, and like has... I guess like a great deal of engagement and power over their audiences on social platforms. Um, like that's sort of that like I, I know that like people say like, oh Kim Kardashian is the ultimate influencer. Mm -hmm. That's sort of true. Um, and I, I mean she is she is an influencer, but she's more than that. I think like when you think of the classic like influencer, it's it's yeah, it's people that have the ability to drive like purchasing decisions or, or affect the behavior of their audiences. 
Yeah, yeah. I would agree. We actually banned the term influencer from our like our copy oh my God. for a whole year because nobody understood what we were talking about. I'm nobody... getting really triggered by that because we Sorry. now Sorry. have to define it in every story that I write. And I think, um, anyway, yeah, it's, it's exactly. like, it. yeah, it's a term that nobody likes. Like influencers don't like being called it because I think that they take it as, oh, that means I have no talent. Like just refer to me as a photographer or whatever. It's like, yeah, but people know you for your Instagram. Yeah, so we used to call them kind of social media stars. I think that's yeah. why YouTube calls their influencers creators. creators. Um, so I think you see that. But I mean, yeah, you're right. I think if you're making the majority of your money and your income from driving people's purchasing decisions, and the reason you're making that money is because mostly brands are paying you to do that, then that's it. But I think to your earlier point actually about engagement, I think the big question now is like, how do you actually decide that that's happening, right? Because with what's happening on social media, those numbers that would decide that these people should make money or shouldn't make money based on the things that they were creating is entirely up for question. So I think it's, I think I've defined influencers up to a point like until today, but I think going forward, it's getting increasingly difficult. Am I an influencer because I drove you know, no. one person? To, oh. No, I mean, no, how do you know? <laughs> I'm just saying, like, I mean, I guess, I guess, like, I mean, Stafner wrote a great story on uh, nano exactly. influencers That's or something. And up. I do think, okay, right, every person, this is like when people are like, Jesus, or like, you know, Jesus was the original influencer or whatever. Like, yeah, like the concept of influence is not new. Like, yeah, every human being has an influence mm -hmm. on like other people. But I think like the broad category of like influencer is basically like, like, do you have somewhat of an audience? Like, I mean, maybe that audience is just your family, but I still think like you're probably not like a classic influencer. Like a classic influencer has that to some scale. Um, and I think you do need some scale to monetize unless, unless like you are this category, like a very particular subcategory of influencer where you're just very directly affecting people. I don't know. I'm just so skeptical of like, yeah. I think yeah. we disagree, but I love it. <laughs> <laughs> you think everyone's an influencer? I definitely am, but I'll let you. <laughs> oh no, I mean, yes, you are in the sense that you're in front of the media. But I guess my question, to, but then I guess my question would be, and maybe there's research on this, would be then if if scale and reach is the is the way to define an influencer, if scale starts mattering less as social media evolves into scale mattering less, then do these people stop being influencers? I don't think scale matters as much as your ability to drive like a, a certain amount of like like you know like. I don't know, like affect a business in a certain way. Like, I mean, everyone has influence, but I do think that you're going to see more people start to define like influencer. And maybe influencer marketing is just, you know, d d devolves into sort of like grassroots marketing campaigns. That could be, that could be real. But I think that like m influencer right now, like that term is shorthand for a specific person. And that person generally has like online, some sort of online clout. And that, but I agree that that might change in the future, um, because I still think people will need a category to describe these type of people that have that kind of online power. That's just my thought. Though. I don't know. Yeah, no, I, th I think it's um, you know the the term itself is is incredibly vexed, and I think part of it is. I see it as a term that in a lot of ways was hijacked from the marketing industry. I mean, to this point about like conversion of sales, and so I think that's. Part of the discomfort is the fact that if you're working in this industry, you don't want to be seen as just a product shill. You want to be seen as a content creator. And so that's where we see kind of this idea of, um, I'm a photographer, or I'm an artist, or again, when I talk to in influencers, and I always use the term in kind of scare quotes, they want to be seen as a, a content creator, someone who's having an impact for their creative agency beyond just, hey, I'm converting products among a so-called audience. Um, and so I think, you know, Audience is a key part, but I think another defining feature that maybe separates an influencer apart from a traditional celebrity is this um, very pervasive sense of self-promotion. And so there's a lot of research on you know, what is called kind of micro-celebrities and thinking about these are not just people who are producing content but they are very vigorously promoting content. So I think kind of the self-branding ethos is really key to understanding so-called, the rise of so-called influencers. So I think the, the fact that a question like how do you define influencers, which is the topic of this entire event, led to such a um, you know, animated discussion just shows what the main difficulty with this is, is if I were to ask any of you, how do you define a corporation or how do you define an, you know, an advertising agency, there would be wide consensus immediately. But um, the reason why 
it's so difficult to talk about these things is because no one actually can agree on one definition mm -hmm. of an influencer. Um, so I, I'm wondering kind of, uh, and this is maybe more uh, for you from kind of an academic perspective, if we're gonna try to set, set digital influencers into some kind of historical or cultural perspective, what are figures in the past, you know, pre-social internet that are, that we, that you see as similar to what influencers are now? I mean, when you say like, for example, Jesus is the first influencer. <laughs> that, I, mean, I didn't make that lineup, that's like before, <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> but that's definitely, you know, you could definitely make the argument that religious leaders or cult leaders are, are kind of, you know, you could draw a line um, through that kind of history. Um, or you talk about mainstream celebrities. Are there any people that you look to when you think about, you know, history repeating itself with influencers? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, we can trace the lineages to a number of, of different, you know, star persona. And as I see it, influencers are kind of a product of these two converging trends. One is the more mainstream celebrity, again, the idea of audience and, and the idea of kind of aspiration. And we want to we want to be like these people. We look up to them. I mean, that's that's so central to it. Um, but also, I think the kind of Silicon Valley ethos of entrepreneurship is really central to understanding this because um, we can't separate influencers apart from the kind of the rise of, of technology and platforms, and so this very um, this very pervasive sense of being your own boss, pulling yourself up by the, the bootstraps, being a um, being an entrepreneur. I think it's so so central and kind of woven into the the fabric that we have again the celebrity discourse, and we also have. Um, entrepreneurs coming together and so that's kind of what's provided a foundation for the emergence to this. I agree with that. Great. <laughs> so it's more, it, it's interesting because um, at face value it, it does seem like it's more of a continuation of celebrity culture but mm -hmm. in fact it's kind of a convergence of entrepreneur, <coughs> uh, of kind of pop entrepreneurship and celebrity uh, culture which is kind of um, Alice Marwick uh, has a book called Status Update and mm -hmm. she, I think, makes a very similar argument. So I'm wondering, and Taylor and I talked a little bit about this beforehand, but if we can point to kind of um, watershed moments in the history of digital influencers that have kind of shaped the environment in which we're in right now. So we had an event here a couple of months ago about um, memes and I asked a very similar question. We talked about, you know, lolcats and planking. <laughs> what, you know, what are things that have shaped how we currently perceive uh, memes as a culture. So, so what are some either individual influencers or kind of news stories that happen that you would say have affected the way a general public and not just people in advertising and in journalism think of influencers? Yeah, I mean, one, one thing that's kind of resonating with me is um, the realization that these are no longer just kids starting YouTube channels and, and you know sitting in their bedroom because I think that's very much the kind of ethos that it was built upon this very amateur aesthetic, but all of a sudden we see the emergence of um, news stories and I, I see them almost daily. Such and such gets paid, mm -hmm. um, you know, a hundred thousand dollars to post, and this idea that it's very easy and. Um, anyone can do it, this democratization ethos, I think, is, is kind of one of the, the larger currents. But in terms of um, technological evolution, and, and I think Taylor can speak to this as well, but the rise of Instagram, um, because the content creators I, I speak with <coughs> find this, um, again, this what a, a watershed moment, because all of a sudden you're going from an individual blog, which you own to Instagram where all of a sudden um, you, you lose a sense of agency and so for the most part influencers in the areas which I've been looking at which tend to be um, fashion, beauty, lifestyle content, they feel that they have to be on Instagram but there's this incredible feeling of discomfort because all of a sudden you are, um, you're beholden to whatever platform changes there are and so thinking about you know their resistance to the algorithms and we can talk more about that, but I think those are kind of two moments that I'd pinpoint. Yeah, that's interesting you say about algorithms, I was going to say sort of just the introduction of the, the concept of an algorithm to me is the big one, like whether it was on Instagram or on Facebook, 
you know, before that. But I think the idea that algorithms rule our lives mm -hmm. has been a big part of what has driven influencers. And I think that's actually, you're right, it's sort of changed this perception that anybody can do it. Because actually, turning out, it turns out that when you have an algorithm, you have to have pretty sophisticated audience development techniques, just like we as publishers, I'm sure, know, to create that audience, maintain that audience, and also be wary of certain changes that Facebook and Instagram then make and stay ahead of them. I mean, I still remember the first ever like Instagram algorithm apocalypse that happened and every single influencer that I followed on my feed suddenly had to figure out, well, how do we make sure that we stay on top? And they mm -hmm. tried to kind of, there were all these rumors floating around at the time where people were like, well, if you press save, it'll work. And not, yeah. a lot of those things didn't work. And I still, there's, there's a lot of mystery and myths around that. but. Then I think there were more, I mean, there were Instagram pods that started developing. There still remain kind of incredible WhatsApp groups. I'm secretly in one of like 500 influencers where they actually go around and make sure that they like every single other influencer's posts. So I think like just the existence of an algorithm has done it. Um, but the other one, you're right, was just that, I mean, I'm a big fan of follow the money. I mean, if, if, some, if, there's a, if Mercedes Benz is going to pay somebody $300,000 to show up and post six photographs, expertly made and edited photographs, but not just create the photos and be a creator, but post them, thereby becoming a distribution network and a media channel as well as a photographer and artist. I mean, that was that moment for me, that when that money became was part of major brand budgets like that was the moment i think that i thought this is a thing i i agree i think that nobody really started paying attention to the space until very recently mm -hmm. like i would say past year and a half maybe two years and i think that's mostly driven by the fact that people suddenly became aware of all this money and also brands started to do like bigger activations with these people and it just I, I think they were suddenly in the public eye more like even though I think you know the YouTube stars had like huge amount of clout whatever like 2014 20, like it was a lot of this this teen thing you know it wasn't like you said like GM or someone was like doing this huge thing we're doing this big rollout like and and so that's so much part of it it's funny well I just want to say what you made a really good point too of just how they are this distribution network too I think so often um, you know people laugh and they're like oh I could do any of that you're just taking <laughs> pictures but like I mean if you do a ten thousand dollar deal with an influencer it can be a really good deal. like you're basically paying for talent production and distribution all in one and all yeah. of those things can be really expensive and sometimes it is actually like a good deal to just pay an influencer to do something. So I think now, of course, they're realizing they don't always get their money where money's worth. But like, yeah. I, I, anyway, I basically think that money is is the big like reason people started paying attention. I think it, like also these people started to get more media attention. Like mm -hmm. um, Sapna was mentioning before we were up on stage, but like the PewDiePie drama, the Logan Paul drama in the past year. Oh, I think also more of these um, like influence like I guess your online influence is taken into account in movie casting in you know advertising deals like all of these places where these people were getting a more public face and like online influence became really important um, to all of these different industries or like even opening a restaurant like if you're a salt bang person like suddenly you get a restaurant <laughs> deal like and so yeah I think like all of those things converge to suddenly um, make them relevant can I say one more thing actually to that? Because I think one big thing culturally was just that sort of there's been also a resurgence, or not a resurgence, really a surge in wellness and fitness to culturally, like forgetting media and advertising and all that for a minute. But I think that the vast majority of influencers tend to enter the space as kind of fit influencers mm -hmm. and fashion. And I think these are two such powerful, kind of culturally relevant and very easy to identify with. Um, factors that I think that had a huge impact. I mean, just the idea of kind of wellness, even as a concept and how much it's taken off just in the last couple of years. And that ex that then means that like products are getting launched that these people can directly go and become partners. With, also, the, also like the rise of e-commerce and things right. like Shopify and pla like places that allow like more of these online stores that like allowed these people to monetize themselves. But yeah. yeah, absolutely. So you guys talked a little bit about uh, the power of algorithms over all aspects of our lives. And we're, we've been talking about platforms kind of in a very general way, but I'm wondering if we could get specific and talk about how specific platforms have treated influencers and creators um, and how specific platform decisions have shaped the landscape today. So if you know, we could try to talk a little bit about you know, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, 
Um, what have the good and bad decisions been that have kind of shaped the way that uh, the landscape currently is? I can start with Instagram just because it's the easiest and then yeah. I'll leave the hard ones to you. Um, but Instagram has been interesting because I think, you know, going back to the fashion thing I was just mentioning, because fashion influencers were sort of the, the big driver of um, content on Instagram obviously for a long time for obvious reasons, it's visual. Um, but I think one of the big things sort of I started thinking about them was when they first um, hired Eva Chen who, you know, obviously was a very, is a very well-known person in sort of the fashion industry. And I think when she went to Instagram as kind of director of fashion partnerships, a large part of her mandate was obviously to work with Burberry and Chanel and all those brands, but also to work with these emerging and in some cases legitimately huge influencers who were all interested in fashion. I think that was sort of a very interesting move from a pretty early day from a platform where I think <laughs> I think we, we'd written a lot about it, and I think for the first time we were saying that maybe the most important and interesting new role inside these platforms is that of influencer czar, influencer arena. We sort of joked around mm -hmm. it in the newsroom, but the person who was there to actually hire, to have influencer relations, to actually go out, meet people, scout people, um, and work with influencer agencies and influencer networks and actually make it a point to have that community outreach come from the platform and not just have it be sort of coming to them was a really smart move because then they were able to figure out best practices very early on compared to some of the other platforms. They were able to tell them, here, do this, you know, in order to do it. And even to this day, I mean, I'm sure Instagram in some ways, you know, often d denies that this happens, but there are people who get kind of bit get testing done earlier, they get a lot of early product features that they can test out with these influencers in early ways. And I know I've spoken to lots of influencer agencies about these things too. So I think just hiring somebody to have that dialogue come from the platform was a really sort of interesting move that I still think they reap the benefits of to this day. I agree with that completely. And I think it was so integral to Instagram. I think like part of probably like the recognition of that was that these people are huge engagement drivers. Mm -hmm. And like Instagram definitely recognize that. I mean, I think there's so much more they can even do in that area. Um, I think tech platforms have struggled with this like so much. And I think that they've been like hesitant to kind of um, too closely partner with their creators like Snapchat notoriously, you know, shunned influencers. And then like a year later, when growth stalled, they're like, wait, actually, we want these people <laughs> driving 20 million views or whatever. Um, and Vine, same thing. <coughs> screwed over their creator network too, or never really had a creator network. They, so I, I think like I think that most of these influencers, like although they're derided, are actually driving can drive huge amounts of engagement on the platform. Um, YouTube also recognized this. Like YouTube has had a partnerships and creator team in place for a long time, and that's why you know these people have thrived. Of course, they're still getting in fights and alienating them in different ways all the time too. But there's always going to be tension. Um, but I think it's it's clear that um, especially social platforms that don't embrace these people will fail. And that's also why you see any kind of emergent social platform is, is usually operating from a creative or creator first growth strategy. Like like all of these small apps when they start any random apps video app will like pay influencers to launch it because they understand that these people mm -hmm. have an audience, can drive engagement, um, stuff like that. Facebook, I mean Facebook's whole they never really were able to Facebook the the old product it, it they never were able to um, embrace influencers because of the way they treat identity and because of the fact that they like had these people have separate pages and then they wanted them to have like verified pages and they kind of messed all that up. And now, you know, there's no Facebook influencers mm -hmm. really. Yeah. I mean, George Takai or whatever. There's people that have big pages, but they're not, it's not the same thing. Right. Okay. So for every, um, well, actually, we, we never mentioned Twitter, if anyone has anything oh, to say yeah. about Twitter. Oh, yeah. Well, I think Twitter's like its own weird thing. I mean, there's yeah. like people that are like entrepreneur influencers on Twitter. Like the hustle people? Yeah. Uh, okay. And like LinkedIn influencers. <laughs> like uh, I, LinkedIn influencers actually are fascinating. I think, I think those, those are, are worth like actual business influencers. Yes. Um, so I think there are a category of LinkedIn influencers that are very real. Um, I don't know that if LinkedIn has like an influencer marketing. They have an influencer. So LinkedIn is a, actually a great example, and I'm glad you don't brought they that like up. Verify influencer. Or do they they, like they do some now? verified verified things. They also LinkedIn is actually really good for traffic. So a lot of the LinkedIn influencers, you're right, tend to be sort of the business, you know, business advice kind of that, and not sort of the fashion people or, or the food people really. Um, but the business, but LinkedIn has done a really nice job. But I think they've always sort of positioned themselves not as like 
we're a place for influence, but we're, we're a publishing company, right? Like they have an editor in chief and they have, and so if we're a publishing company, then we can't be doing influencer marketing. But I think that a lot of content driven, sort of words driven influencers actually find pretty good home there. And at least I see, they have very high engagement on there when you actually get on there. So it's fascinating to watch. Yeah, and there's also kind of the idea of the, the platform ecology, and essentially it's the fact that um, a lot of these influencers have to evolve with each new platform, and there's two models, and one is, you know, I'm a, a Twitter influencer, or I'm on Facebook, or, or LinkedIn, but at the same time, um, a lot of these people are expected, or at least compelled, to establish a brand persona across various platforms. And so there's this kind of give and take between the platforms and the content creators, which, you know, we saw when, um, Instagram sort of incorporated the, the stories element. And so, um, you know, in one sense, the rise of stories was kind of disrupting this whole idea that, that Instagram is this very aspirational, like have your, your beautiful curated top nine um, and, and integrating these moments of authenticity into your feed. But at the same time, um, you know, it's, it's still a lot of work that is required. And then it's like, how do, how do we convert this? for marketing and advertisers want to see kind of a conversion of metrics and so okay well it's easier to see when we're looking at the the flat photo on Instagram but how do we think about mm -hmm. um, metrics and engagement when we're on something like a story format and that's funny because I don't know if anybody remembers Amazon Spark because like that that was supposed to be Amazon's influencer product okay. and I think I, I might have been entirely harsh, but I think we called it the autopsy of Spark that we published two or three months ago. <laughs> but um, but Spark never took off because I don't because I think it is interesting to see these like social first platforms yeah. well, do okay. better. Do you mind doing like just a quick one sentence description of what Amazon Spark? So Amazon Spark essentially, and please help me out, Taylor, <laughs> if you remember exactly. So essentially, it was supposed to be this is our own influencer product. You were it was invite only. Um, you could you could sign on and then you would basically be able to use Amazon product uh, influence purchasing decisions on Amazon products but it lived within the Amazon app so it wasn't its own network although they were trying to create essentially a Facebook on Amazon as far as I could tell but it you know lasted for two years um, never got much traction but I think it's an interesting way to kind of look at social first platforms versus, versus clearly retail first platforms um, and maybe even now advertising platform but not really thinking of it as like a social media place nobody's hanging out there unlike even LinkedIn where people hang out I hear yeah I and I, yeah I think was that, that I, I think you're yeah and I yeah. do think that it's like that the, the part of the reason that it failed was because it's not a social first platform and that's so, like so much part of like discovery also it's funny because I was just on Amazon teen today oh, um, which is their teen portal and it's so heavily integrated with Instagram like they have all Instagram influencers recommending products like it's had, Amazon teen has an Instagram account um, but it, it also like kind of back to what you were saying I think more influencers as these platforms have kind of like struggled to figure out themselves like have also realized that they can't be dependent on a single platform and so many of them as soon as they That's get enough followers on musically like they're immediately like follow me on this follow me on this follow me on this because they know how um, you know how quickly an algorithm change can hit them and they can they very quickly lose access to their audience so I, yeah a lesson all publishers should know yeah <laughs> I think we should open up, open it up to questions soon. But I, I want to ask just one last thing um, back to you, Brooke, because I, I just think it's, um, it's such an interesting part of your work. I, when we have a, the rise of this new kind of cultural figure with some clout, there's for every influencer there are so many other people who are failed influencers, and you write a lot about the concept of aspirational work. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you wanted to talk a little bit about that um, in the context of the of this discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so to me, as I said earlier, you know, I find the kind of the labor component of this very compelling and, and worthy of attention. And so um, I've done a lot of interviews with young influencers, mostly women, and I'm struck by the amount of um, unpaid labor that is required of this. And so again, we have the sense that anyone can go out and do it, but it takes an incredible amount of, of time and strategy and networks and education to, to build a following, to have a consistent brand with which advertisers want to work. And so um, you know, I see this as a way where exploitation can be really rife within this industry. Mm -hmm. And certainly there's a, there's a longer backstory to this. I mean, we can think about in journalism, unpaid internships, or the creative industries in general, kind of this whole idea of, of the hustle and working for exposure. So I don't see this as something that's necessarily new, but I think it's intensified by the promises 
of digital media. Again, this idea that it's, it's democratic, anyone can do it, anyone can be an entrepreneur. And um, you know, I, I talk a lot about the, the term entrepreneurship because when I was in college, I was an advertising major. Like I, I never thought I wanted to be an entrepreneur. That wasn't even on my radar. And you know, teaching college students now, so many people see this as kind of this, um, this ideal dream. But when we think about entrepreneurship, in a lot of ways, it's, it's another term for, for independent work. And there's a lot of instability and insecurity that, that pervades influencer marketing, just as the creative industries more generally. Great. So I think um, on that note, we'll open it up to questions for, for maybe 10 minutes. And uh, Katie has a microphone there. Thank you. Um, what numbers are we talking about with digital influencers? Are we talking about 1,000, 5,000, 10,000 per person? And what in your assessment is the best mix of platforms for cross-branding as you talked about? Well, I think um, some people in the audience, Sapna can just wrote a really great piece on, <laughs> sorry, just keep calling out her story that I loved, but uh, on like sort of the number of influence and how that number, how, like basically how the following number has become really irrelevant. Um, I think like, I don't know, it used to be this thing, even when I was in advertising, people would be like, okay, yeah, like what is this? Do we need, do they need mm -hmm. to have 10,000 followers? Are you not an influencer? Do you have 100,000? I think that that is kind of going away, like at like, kind of like what we were discussing in the beginning. I think you need like the ability to, to influence a certain probably threshold of people, um, but it depends what, like I think the brand wants to probably define what mm -hmm. audience you should reach. I don't think there's like a magic number that you can reach and become an influencer. Um, so much is also based on like your own self promotion. I think the numbers actually, yeah, become less relevant. I mean, if I talk to CMOs and I ask, well, what do you look for, chief marketing officers at big companies, and I say, what do you look for when it comes to your, and what influencers you want to work with? It's, it's less and less that they're telling me, okay, it's, I only want people with 100,000 plus followers. Yes, there's a base level that they've probably decided to set, but they're looking at everything from who follows, who actually follows them versus how many followers they have. So somebody is just like, I only want, um, people with majority female followings under the age of 24 who are also into X, Y, and Z interest groups. So you're looking at like demographic makeup more than that. Obviously more and more, even if somebody has 100,000 followers, how many of those are bots? How many of those actually fake? How many followers do the followers have is actually a really new, is the newest thing I've heard. Is that there's more of a network effect going on with like people wanting to reach people who then want to reach people because Instagram now has the options to repost things more and more. So you're actually seeing a lot of different metrics being used. The follower count still obviously matters. Um, but there's also all of these really interesting kind of, as the marketing itself becomes as complicated as the rest of digital marketing, I think they're starting to just look at different numbers. Yeah, I think it's also just um, like these platforms have become so complicated and there are so many different metrics that you can measure by, like stories is a good example. Some people thrive on Instagram stories and people don't like, so I think it's like probably the marketers goals and then also these like, you know, influencers having like very different strengths in different areas and different features even within the same app. Um, and same thing with what platform, I think that totally also depends on what, who you're trying to reach. So it's really up to the marketer to determine. Hi, um, I'm a big fan of all of your work. I follow you all on Twitter. I'm so <laughs> glad to see you in person. Um, my question is about business models. And Taylor, your uh, recent piece about that micro monetization of influence um, that you just wrote this last week oh, yeah. was so great. Um, and so I've been trying to teach about influencing in my classes. I'm a college professor. And um, I've thought a lot about the platform issue. Where, so when they're, when they're demonstrating a brand and, and using it, the platform doesn't necessarily get a cut. Like YouTube doesn't get a piece um, when the brand has made the deal directly with the influencer. So I wonder if that fits in with what you were just saying about how some platforms didn't really cooperate with influencers because they weren't getting it. I mean, piece. even now, Instagram doesn't have, doesn't take a cut of all the brand deals happening on their sure. platform, which is kind of like weird to think about, but. Right, yeah, but they figured out that they need it to grow the platform. I think it's the point that you were yeah. making that was really interesting. And so my other part of the question is that the influencers, I think, are also really um, diversifying into other revenue sources like merchandise, mm -hmm. Um, and that micro monetization you were talking about, because I'm wondering if they, they don't feel quite secure with relying on the brands to keep sending them that reliable revenue. Oh. And so mm -hmm. the appearances, um, the merch, 
um, the affiliate marketing, all these other, mm -hmm. so I wonder if you could just address some of that, like where you see things going with these sort of business models okay. for the influencers Diversified themselves. Diversified revenue, I guess, is, is great for every business, right? Like, it's great for media, nobody wants to be just rel reliant on advertising, we want subscriptions, we want, you know, in some cases IP. I think it's the same thing with influencers, and I think one place that uh, we see a lot of influencers going to, like you said, is merchandise, but I think one big one is also media, right? We've seen a lot of people who were born born as influencers and then has have gone on to you know tv video over the top tv do you know video a lot more video and just have essentially media empires and then go on from there but i think you are seeing a diversification of revenue because just like publishing and just like any other business you cannot live or die by facebook i mean just you know there's it, i think there's plenty of evidence yeah uh, especially in the news today to to show you that so i yeah and um that, that I think everything that you said is so correct for, like for any business you want to diversify also like we were talking about earlier like you know people are realizing these platforms are unreliable the story that I wrote was about SoundCloud rappers who like monetize more than anyone like they charge for every single thing like likes comments share like any feature of the app like they'll be like okay Venmo me two bucks and sure I'll do that for you and and which is really like interesting in the sense that like these are this this community has like embraced this like m like monetizing every single feature of every app and I do think that that speaks to like this larger trend of like people trying to figure out like what do brands want and also how can I like extract as much money from from these platforms as possible. It's also direct, right? Yeah. Like, why wouldn't right, exactly. I, instead of going to Mercedes and getting them to pay me, like, exactly. why don't I just get my audience to pay me? Yeah. Just like, we'd rather sell magazines directly to you than yeah. I would wait for also, a brand not, to sell advertising to Yeah, you. and a lot of that income is not tax reported. It's just through PayPal. It's just through family. Venmo. Yeah, well, so, <laughs> which is, which is like good for, especially, you know, those brand deals, they don't always pay out on time. Like, these are companies that sometimes pay 90 days, 120 days, sure. like, and, and don't forget all the people in the middle who right. now come out. There's the agencies now, and then there's the, the influencer networks, and, these, and they all have agents, and there's managers, mm -hmm. and then, so you're basically seeing why not take a direct, direct yeah. is always better. Why not charge for your quote tweets or whatever. <laughs> Katie, how are we on time? Oh, okay, great. We'll go in the front. Uh, so I thought the distinction between the uh, words-based content influencers on LinkedIn and image-based content influencers everywhere else was interesting. And so that made me think of if any of you know any instance of influencers getting like a sponsored post where they're not actually uh, showcasing fashion or travel or anything, but they're just posting content. Uh, have you ever seen that kind of relationship between an influencer and a publishing company? When you say content, I think um, I'm like a link maybe. somewhere. Um, oh, things that they didn't make. Right. Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, that's also essentially then going back to this idea that we were just saying that they're creators and their distribution networks. Sometimes they're just creators, in which case they're paid to just great, make great photography, for example. But in many cases now, they're paid to just retweet or paid to just repost. I mean, all those uh, meme accounts, you yeah. could say like that's their main business, or, or like the yeah. George Takai right. Facebook page, like, it's just a distribution. Now. Well, actually, right. we'll talk about that a lot in the next panel. I don't because it's all about uh, business models, and Max has uh, and Max has written a lot about, about uh, <laughs> just. Uh, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but <laughs> um, we'll do one more question. Hi, everyone. This is so exciting to see you all here. Um, I am wondering with all of the, all of this, if you pay me and sponsor me and all of that, which when you look at the feeds, isn't an obvious feature. In fact, it's more about, I'm authentic. I'm a real person. I really just do this for fun. Just wondered if you could say a little bit more about where that's going with all of the changes that you're discussing. This idea that these are real people and they really like these things and they're genuine and they're authentic. Is that going by the wayside, or what's happening now in this climate to authenticity? Well, I, think, I think they're becoming less authentic, but yeah. that's just me. Yeah, I mean, it's you know always this kind of uneasy relationship between authenticity and, and promotion, but I think what happens is, um, in terms of the, the conversion and so forth, we see this professionalization where, you know, this this whole ideal was built on the ethos of the organic, the authentic, the grassroots culture, and they can't completely subvert that or they will lose the audience on which they have built. And so at the same time that influencers, in terms of monetization, 
are establishing rate cards just like we would see in the magazine industry. And so somebody reaches out to them and they say, okay, this is my you know, rate, this is how much I, I charge and, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, there's this larger call out culture that if they kind of defy either one of these norms by being too promotional or too authentic, they're gonna face the, the larger call out. And so it's just kind of um, keeping influencers within these boundaries that they have to tell. Did you, did you see that Listerine post? I feel like that was the tipping point for me where there was an no, image of an it. influencer who woke up one morning and had a stack of pancakes next to her and a bottle of Listerine and she's like, good morning <laughs> world. <laughs> that was my tipping point. I was like, this, is, this thing is over. <laughs> that, yeah, that sounds you remember about right. This. And as soon as you start to think about, um, you know, if influencers need to draw audience and, and advertisers, as soon as you start thinking about these external constituents, of course you lose kind of the, the inner ethos that has drawn these to you. Um, yeah, and I think YouTubers have sort of walked that line for a while. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, YouTuber, like YouTube stars for a long time have always like sort of towed that line between like how much branded stuff do I do versus how much whatever. Um, it's just something I guess you have to worry about. Same with like a media company, like you have to worry how many, ad, how many ads you put on the page. I mean, less about authenticity, but more about like ad load and like how much can your uh, followers handle. Mm -hmm. Great, um, thank you guys so much. Uh, let's give uh, our panelists a round of applause. And I think we'll switch over. Our second discussion is about emerging business models with influencers, and then the final one is on misinformation and polarization and kind of the dark side of things. Um, so I'll, yes, we need, we'll mic everyone up and then be back in two minutes. <laughs> All right. Yeah, thank you so much. Test, test, test. Right now, so I'm
Um, okay, yeah, are you guys, uh, are you all, um, are you all mic'd up? Come on up and I'll get us, get us started. Yeah, we have about a minute Make sure that... Okay, guys, can we get if we can um, yeah, if you I take your seats, we'll get started with the second part. Everyone came back from Thanksgiving, wasn't it? Pops, yeah, it's the uh, okay. Can you take your seats, please? Eating and the travel and the family time. Yeah. Great, thank you very much indeed. So, uh, second panel, um, which uh, we just touched on about um, emerging business models or maybe declining business models, I don't know. Um, we have a fantastic sort of panel, um, this time uh, of people in the business, uh, plus uh, journalists who've been specifically uh, looking at the business model aspects. So I'm gonna, again, do the lazy chair thing of uh, asking my panel to introduce themselves, starting with Natalie. Great. Um, I'm Natalie Silverstein. I um, help oversee the New York office of an influencer marketing agency called Collectively. Uh, we're based in San Francisco, and essentially what we do is provide um, influencer marketing strategy and execution services for big brands. So we work with mostly Excellent. Fortune 100 companies and help them connect with influencers. I will make you explain all of that in Great. close detail I'm sorry in a for the jargon. <laughs> and, hi, um, I'm Sapna Maheshwari. I am the advertising reporter at the New York Times, which is the most sprawling bee in the world. Um, and a lot of my work um, lately has been exploring more of the influencer marketing world. And I'm Max Willems. I'm a reporter at uh, Digiday. I write about uh, publishers mostly and how they monetize outside of uh, traditional advertising. So. Uh, subscriptions, commerce, but also increasingly things like influencer marketing. Great, thanks. So Natalie, let's start with you. What exactly, you, you, you described a little bit, that you know, you have clients, uh, you're like an agency. What is it that you do every day when you get, when you get into the work in the morning? What does, it, what does a digital influencer agency actually do? Sure. Um, so we, we respond to our clients, we work with brands in kind of deep partnership to help them connect their messages, their products, new things they're doing with digital communities that they're inter interested in, in reaching. And kind of the vector for that are influencers. Uh, vectors for that are influencers. And so our work is to kind of come up with the creative strategy of like, okay, you say you want to work with the influencer world. Okay, what, what should that mean? We actually kind of diagnose for those clients. Okay, well actually, based on what you're doing, you should be working with people on these platforms in right. these specific ways at these levels in this, you know, kind of with this sort of brief. And then this is how we're going to help connect you with the right people through kind of combination of art and science with on-brand creative content, data about their audiences right. and their performance, and then we actually produce right. those programs. So, so. So, tell me a bit about that. Um, so, so tell me a bit about the marriage of data and uh, data science and art, sure. or you know, content and, and data. Where yeah. do you get that from, and how, how does that exactly work? What are people looking for? Are they looking for something we just talked about? Scale not being such a big thing anymore. Is that? Not um, true. Well, I, I think our, you know, we were definitely a creative agency kind of archetype in this space. There are lots of different kinds of organizations that are servicing the influencer marketing needs of companies and, um, and of influencers. So there are companies like us, which are much more like a kind of creative services agency, like kind of an advertising, you know, more like that, looks more like that, compared to like a sort of SaaS platform where it's just like a marketplace where I know some of the reporters who are you know, talking to you tonight have co covered a lot of kind of some of the 
kind of impersonal interactions that are happening on those platforms. So, 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 so just to really break it down for people who may not be completely familiar with it, those are kind of almost like automated platforms, yes. right? Like that, so that it's like real-time trading in influence. Kind of. It's like a brand will come forward, let, they'll kind of like log in to said platform and say, hey, this is our need. We're looking for this kind of influencer. And then influencers on the other side, it's like a marketplace, will kind of like offer up their services. And then those, there's kind of the only intermediary is the technology as opposed to, in our context, the intermediary is a team of experts who have, has worked for you know the last decade in this space and understands kind of the nuance mm -hmm. of how to really get great performance. In terms of the art and the science, the art is really understanding a brand, you know, kind of being able to recognize its context within its larger market, the products, how the products might play in different communities, the communities that they're really interested in reaching, and then kind of what is on brand and kind of in alignment with what that organization would, would feel really comfortable and excited about kind of seeing out in the world. I think we've moved into a, a, a reality in marketing where brands don't own their brands anymore. Their customers and advocates and influencers and just people talking online kind of own their brands, right? So figuring out who are the right people to kind of show, show up for the brand in the best possible way. So kind of that's the so art. How, so how do you find that? Do you find that just by scraping these sites or do so, you know the people or do yeah. you follow the followers? I mean, all of the above. We have a community, actually a community function within Collectively that's a dedicated team that is constantly looking um, on the horizon of great content creators across all the platforms. We have people coming to us. Um, we have a very kind of significant vetting process to look to make sure their content is premium content, that they're, um, they're not engaging in the kind of activity that we, you know, a lot of us are interested in and covering around kind of fraudulent engagement and all of that. Um, fraudulent engagement? Yeah. What is fraudulent engagement? It's like... I feel like I've done that at a party or two. Sorry? I said I feel like I've fraudulently engaged Yeah, I was going to say, I, fra I fraudulently party. engage every <laughs> so single day. Uh, How can you tell not, it, if they're fraudulently well, engaging? I mean, I think there's that's a, a bigger conversation okay. around, you know, we can get to that. Let me. Yeah, yeah let's, I'll, let's, I'll let's get to that. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm excited to learn what that is. Okay. And so, if I can make money from it. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, um, you know, we have in our contracts with influencers who join our network that like that's not you're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed right. to engage in that sort of thing. So right. people are are buying. Um, they're kind of this underground or WhatsApp group or kind of shady forums where people are able to purchase likes, follows. Mm -hmm. shares, etc. Mm -hmm. um, and either they're purchasing them from individual people who are just actually doing the labor, it's actually a human doing the labor of liking, 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 or it's actually a, a bot farm somewhere, right. it's actually you know, right. digitally done. The platforms I think are ultimately re responsible for this kind of activity and have you know, consistently made noises about fixing it, um, whether that's actually going to work or not is I think a, a and, big question. And one more question before I move on to Sapna, what's happening to your business? Is it growing? Growing. Right. Yes. How, can you give us any figures? Um, we don't disclose our actual revenues, but I would say that year over year we're growing like 30, 40 percent. 30 to 40 percent? 20, 30, 40 percent, depending, yeah. I'm right. thinking about the last, we're, we're five years old, so this is a very right. young industry in general, and we're really considered one of the kind of old guard and the kind of the agency, influencer agency dedicated. Because two years ago, people were saying this is like just a bubble. This is just going to go away. Yeah, I don't see that happening. Right. Okay. Um, Let's let me ask Satna if she sees it happening. So, so you've been um, you introduced me to the um, uh, concept of the nano influencer, which I like to see myself as within my own <laughs> house. As Congratulations. I say, that. <laughs> thank you very much. I, I mean, I see, see myself as that. If you ask my kids, they would say that's not true. You've never influenced us to do anything. But tell us about. So, so you've been covering the the as you say the sprawling business of advertising and um, how does, you know, do, do you see influence as, or influencers as being central to how the industry is going to develop or is it still actually a pretty peripheral thing? Uh, it's hard. I mean, right now, it's interesting. So obviously, when you think about traditional advertising, the biggest money is spent on TV ads still. Um, and obviously, a lot of the big mass things that you see, billboards, etc., that's where a lot of the money remains. Influencer marketing is, there's a lot of it coming from PR firms. Um, more of it is, has made its way into the media agencies. Um, but it has, it has been getting bigger. And I think what's interesting is you see it in every industry. Um, in the toy industry, all those YouTube channels, you see it, of course, in the more traditional with the fashion bloggers, etc. cetera. But um, I don't see it going away anytime soon. I think. The idea is wherever attention is, advertisers are going to find a way to get there. 
And you can buy ads on Instagram, but they still want the authenticity of a non-ad. And, and that's what they see with the influencer marketing. It doesn't feel like an ad, and therefore it's more convincing to you. And so that's why they want to work with these people. So, so, so just talk a bit about um, nano-influencers, which you, you yeah. wrote this piece about, because that goes to the heart of this issue about are we just looking at followers and scale? And it, mm-hmm. you, know, you, you really kind of laid, laid out why that's not the case now. Yeah, so a nano-influencer is a person with as few as 1,000 Instagram followers. Um, and a lot of this conversation, of course, is focused on Instagram and YouTube, where a lot of the money is going. Um, and this is where brands are basically um, working with firms who are identifying uh, people who are kind of like your cool friend in high school or your, uh, the one who kind of gave product recommendations or just a friend you have who is good at Instagram, like just tends to always have more than 100 likes if you're, which I think if you're in your late 20s or 30s, it's a lot. <laughs> Not so much with high schoolers today. And if, you're in your, if you're in your 50s, Hypothetically, it does seem like a lot. <laughs> I think I think more than a hundred's a lot in my small sphere, but I'm no nano, um, and so that's great. <laughs> I'm no nano. Is no that, nano. That's, a, that's a phrase. Um, and so, so what's really interesting is the woman I interviewed uh, for my article, or one of the agency women <coughs> I talked to, was telling me, you know, back in the old days, you'd go to Michael Jordan and you would want him to wear the Nike logo on his shoes. You know, then influencer marketing emerged. You could go to a hundred people and ask, you know, with big followings and get them to wear Nike shoes. She's like, now it's gotten more expensive and, and you know, it might not be seen as authentic anymore. So let's go to a thousand people. And now we have the technology to track, uh, okay, um, we contacted these people. Maybe we give them a coupon code. Maybe we uh, track their friends in some other way. Like, let's figure out how to harness even smaller people. So it's really kind of run the gamut. And, and what's the kind of, uh, you know, return on investment for this? Because one of the criticisms um, that, or, you know, one of the s- sceptical critiques of um, influencer marketing, which I've heard from PR executives, I've heard it from mainstream advertising executives, is saying, you know, they're going to find out that actually this doesn't really deliver the ROI that they're expecting. Is that is that true? I mean, that is, it's such a difficult question because I think, for example, you know, you saw the Times did a a really big piece at the start of the year, um, the Follower Factory. It was all about all this fraudulent engagement. Mark Hansen, who's over there, who'll be chairing the next panel, (laughs) partially responsible, in fact, entirely responsible. It was an amazing story, and but none of this stuff. It didn't have an impact on the growth of this industry. I mean, it it's just continuing to grow, and so. I, I don't know, I think... So there must be something that people are seeing in their figures or their sales, yeah. which means that they're going to continue to Many of the people I interview it. who are influencers say that often brands don't even ask for them to screenshot even their analytics on how the post did, to even get the impressions. Right. I mean, we've found so many examples of influencer firms um, sort of giving insane numbers of impressions that they've gotten on specific campaigns. Um, I think one of them that I reached out to in the spring for a story on bots was saying that they reached maybe 900 million impressions for a Bush's Beans campaign. What? Yeah, you know how many people <laughs> live in America. And yeah. so I reached out to them and they do a lot of work with Walmart and I was asking them, asking them, they ignored so many emails and phone calls and then finally they gave me some, you know, one paragraph about what their firm does, just did not address it. Right. And they never even changed the website after the article ran. So right. it's just like the stuff is out in plain sight and it's just, continuing to happen. So even though we have exactly the same issues that we've always to some extent had in digital advertising of kind of ad fraud and dark traffic and what have you, people, if it's growing, people just don't care. Okay. So Max, I mean, people who should care, I guess, are the publishers. So, you know, how is this hitting the world of publishing? Because, you know, our business is very much, or has been very much not about influencers. Historically, it hasn't been, but, uh, you know, as digital media has sort of flattened everything and a, a publisher could be thought of as an influencer, an influencer could be thought of as a publisher, like, it's starting to get a little bit more enmeshed in the publishing sphere. Um, this can be something as obvious as um, a publisher buying or building an influencer agency. The New York Times owns one, um, Nylon owns one. Um, in some cases, publishers uh, will look to sort of internal members of their editorial teams and try to kind of cultivate them as influencer voices. Refinery29 does this a little bit. 
Uh, BuzzFeed has recently stood up uh, what they're calling talent programs at some of its consumer brands. So Tasty has a talent program. This is sometimes in, uh, means kind of leveling up people that are already famous. So like Marcus Samuelson, who uh, you know is a James Beard award-winning chef and restaurateur, is one of them. But so also is one of the people that made a lot of the videos uh, that Tasty produced. So it's really sort of looking to build kind of a constellation of people around its own brand that it can use to promote messages of theirs or uh, serve advertiser needs or whatever it happens to be. The publishers are, are finding influencers useful. Um, I think in part because they're, some of them are desperate to do anything to please advertisers and partly because uh, extended reach, extended relationships with audiences, those are all things that any publisher uh, that has a digital presence finds useful. So sort of if you think about the traditional publishing model, and even when I say traditional, I mean you know, kind of legacy digital almost, kind of sort of changing. Um, instead of having, as it were, you know, kind of like a fashion vertical, you may just have uh, people who are effectively fashion influencers that where the money sticks to them rather than perhaps the content. Is that is that the idea? It's, it's possible, yeah. I mean, the, the problem with doing that, and this is a, a point of tension that BuzzFeed in particular has experienced, where they uh, developed a lot of people who were... Uh, very creative, very good at creating video content. And then they, they found that after they had kind of put a lot of energy into building them up, they then said, great, thank you, and left. And then all of a sudden they were left with, uh, without this talent that they, had, that they had inculcated. And so what you're starting to see a little bit is publishers trying to figure out ways to keep those folks closer, whether it's um, by tying it directly to, um, you know, kind of core editorial product. In some cases, they're also looking to uh, keep people on retainer, so that's sort of a simple, uh, more straightforward way of keeping them in your orbit is just saying, we're going to pay you money every month to keep you close. So this is a kind of like, like, this is such a different, I mean, I don't know, is it very different from what publishers have done traditionally? Because it feels as though there are some areas of this which are so alien to what we used to sort of thinking about our business of separation, and yet it's pretty close to what people have been doing for years in native advertising. Right, exactly. I mean, that's what's so funny is that if you were to have an alien species come down to, you know, planet Earth and examine all of this, they might say, well, what is the difference? You know, if potentially, if you work at a, at a lifestyle publisher, a fashion magazine, for example, you are constantly deluged with free gifts that you get to try on, take home. You know, there's really not much problem with, you know, grabbing something and bringing it home and wearing it out, maybe taking a photograph of yourself with it. Um, you look at commerce publishing, which is something that a lot of publishers have glommed onto, where it's sort of like, these are the best uh, air conditioners, hair products, lipsticks, whatever. And uh, there, and a lot of those publishers that have moved in that direction are now also starting to launch uh, essentially like sponsored posts that uh, fulfill the same function. You are able to buy the product directly in the post. And if you look at it from a certain vantage point, that looks an awful lot like influencer marketing. You are leveraging the audience and trust and credibility that a certain entity has built up, and you are using that to move product, improve the consideration of something. And so yeah, it, it sounds and seems like something that is completely divorced from what you think of a traditional publisher's role as being, but in, increasingly, I don't know that they're, that they're that different from one another, which some people find very disturbing and other people do not. Depends on where you... So, so, so sort of question for the group, um, I guess, which is, you know, where, is it, where does this go next? So, you know, we t you know, how would we see these sort of trends developing? I mean, it doesn't seem to me that there are a lot of digital publishers who are doing particularly well out of it at the moment. Is there, wh where is the flex in the business model going to be? I think that in terms of just focusing purely on the publishing side of it, a lot of it is going to depend on how symbiotic they can make the relationship. So like th that's sort of what BuzzFeed in particular is looking to do, where they have this enormous uh, social reach that they can kind of plug anybody into. Obviously, they need to have some requisite amount of charisma and talent and creativity, but that's a great kind of starting point that they can use. And, then, and also, too, a bunch of relationships with advertisers. And so I think it's possible that BuzzFeed or a publisher like it might start uh, you know, competing for business that collectively gets, where they can sort of say, 
you know, we have the relationship with the advertisers. We have this uh, stable of people that can deliver something that's compelling and authentic seeming and, uh, yeah, just ticks a lot of those marketer boxes. Um, and the thing that they add as an extra layer of value is they can say, so we can hook you up with 30 influencers that will make something awesome. And by the way, here's a ton of high impact ad inventory that we have or a ton of video that we could do. And have we mentioned that we have an events business? You know, so it's sort of like it's one more sort of um, lure they can throw into the water that, where they hope an advertiser might bite. So I think that that's the thing that potentially uh, speeds publisher adoption of influencers as kind of a dimension of their monetization strategy. Natalie, do you see Biz, BuzzFeed, BuzzFeed, uh, BuzzFeed um, and similar, again, you know, digitally native publishers have, have had a rough week uh, and they are, you know, even Jonah Peretti is saying, hey, we need to merge for scale. Um, so do you see them coming after your business and, and how is, you know, is there a different space that you guys are moving to or you're sort of confident that it's not actually the role of a publisher to yeah, do that I, kind of stuff? I mean, we really see the pie just continuing to grow and that, um, you know, digital first kind of digital native publishers have been a part of this mix for a while. So, you know, companies like Refinery that have an influencer marketing entity within their kind of creative studio, they've been in the mix for sure. And there are several others that are kind of there, but they, they you know, they cater to a very specific audience, right? And I, kind of this is where this idea of art and science and influencer marketing is kind of finding the right kind of people with the right kinds of audiences. And that's where kind of using the, the, the data that, and this is where we're, we're reliant on the platforms in a lot of ways. And that's the conversation about how they restrict or open up their APIs and all of that. And there's been a lot of change over the course of the past 12 months with Facebook in particular around this obviously Cambridge Analytica being a part of that. Um, but, uh, you know, seeing exactly kind of who it is that the, the um, advertisers are really interested in. And um, while the publishers have, you know, they have reach on kind of their own channels as well as the social channels, um, they may not be the right people. And the content may not be able to be utilized in other ways in quite the same capacity as a, a much wider set of influencers across channels Right. Um, creating assets that then the brands can kind of hook into their existing massive content marketing ecosystems, which is a gaping maw of like, this endless need of content. So, so. That, so, so, so there's a question here as well, because we keep coming back to the platforms and the fact that they still, you know, pretty much kind of control the dials on this. Um, and it seems to me, uh, you know, something I'll be interested in, 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 in what you think about this, having just looked at the nano influencer market. Um, this is all happening at a time when we're being consistently told that, you know, there's an erosion of trust in institutions and that it's all about kind of personal relationships, etc. Um, but it's, you know, to, to what extent is that just an illusion? So in other words, it feels as though these are platform plays and this is aggregation of kind of micro activity, but, to a, but controlled at a very sort of high level by big companies. Right. Well, I don't know if this exactly answers it, but I, I feel like from my reporting on YouTube and on the influencer market, we see time and time again that these platforms are really great for individuals and not really news organizations and for publishers. So it's really a lot easier for PewDiePie or one of these top YouTube stars to make a lot of money off the ads rolling on YouTube than it is maybe for <coughs> a publisher to try and make a channel and make ad revenue in that way with all the requisite production, fact checking, all of the information that kind of goes into it. So um, I, I think that all of these platforms really YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, they need scale mm -hmm. in order to thrive. Um, and I think YouTube is actually a really good example of this because the way they've structured it, they're making money off all these really popular videos when an ad runs usually 40% of it. Um, and so in those cases, um, I think that the platforms really need all this user-generated content. Now that we see Facebook uh, launching Facebook Watch, that's their answer to TV, which looks a lot like YouTube right now. They've slowly been amassing more and more pages. It started with, um, it was populated more with the business insiders of the world, WWE stars, things you would have heard of. 
uh, in the past couple of months, and this is a story I'm working on now, it's really expanded to that, like more of what you would associate with YouTube. And so you're kind of seeing that dynamic at play again. These people are starting to make advertising money there. Um, they're starting to kind of build their own spheres of influence. And so in that sense, it's growing. And again, it's an individual that's being championed there, not so much the organizations we know. Right. So that feels like really bad news for Natalie and actually you guys as well. And I, I don't know, maybe kind of, you know, Columbia University too, as we are an institution. Um, do, but what, you know, is, is there, can advertising platforms or agencies like yourself, can publishers stand up against this kind of, you know, resettlement of the business? Do you think that, you know, what, why wouldn't, a, an Instagram or a Facebook or a YouTube just squeeze all of the value that uh, you guys are currently getting out in the market um, and for themselves? Um, well, I think while the platforms are starting to build their own products and kind of m making moves, they're building, building up teams that are kind of responsible. There's a team at Facebook called the Media Monetization Team that I think is working on some of the behind the scenes platform, sort of like, you know, um, matchmaking kinds of, of products within Facebook and similarly for Instagram. Um, but what I think those platforms and just generally people misunderstand about this work is that it, there's a lot of work that goes into doing this well. So in order to actually get content that isn't just like literally like pancakes and somebody on the previous panel talked about a post yes. where it was about for Listerine, pancakes and Listerine waking up at the, you know, Which incidentally, oh, what, a terrible, idea. what yeah, a terrible idea that so, is. Anyway, so that's yes. what we would call bad influencer marketing. We've all seen it is bad. Um, to do good influencer marketing requires a, a significant amount of work. I mean, everything from the kind of basic, like we're talking about kind what of... Is, what is good influencer marketing? Somebody want to talk? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, to, you find me best. Sure. Yeah, yes, you, you, you do. To me, <laughs> to me, it's when um, you know part of our process is really trying to find great content creators, people who have a voice that's unique that actually do like the brand, where they actually mm. like truly do have something unique to say about the brand, where it's not just product placement. It doesn't feel sort of like an afterthought of like, here's my Diet Coke, um, I'm skiing or whatever. It feels like there's... Is there anyone we could follow who would fit that that people look at I on mean, their phones right uh, now? I mean, there are... Sorry, who? There's a YouTuber named Philip DeFranco who genuinely uses all the products that sure. he's shown and he actively just says, well, I'm not BSing you, like, this is actually a really good product and he has a really big following on YouTube right. and a lot of people just use the products that he endorses Sure. Yes. I mean, I, I, right. there are literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of influencers in the world. So I'm not going to call out yeah. people directly. I think that to speak to that question of whether or not Facebook uh, or YouTube are just going to wring all the value out of this for themselves, you can see them starting to try to flatten this out as much as possible to have competition come in and, and as you say, extract as much value as possible. So. That matchmaking tool that you described that Facebook has, they've been sort of testing it on and off for about a year. Mm -hmm. um, what I think is really interesting about it, and so the way it works, just, um, just to tell everybody in the room, is basically like if you're a, somebody who fancies him or herself an influencer, you can put yourself into this system and essentially, in a way that's only the brands can see, flag things that you're interested in. So I'm Max, I really like Bose, I really like the NBA, I really like. Nike, I really like Balenciaga. And then if someone from those brands thinks they need influencers, they can basically just tap and I and presumably thousands of other people will come up and then they can you know, execute some sort of deal or initiate a relationship. Facebook has said that for now they're not taking any money, but they're just waiting until a fever pitch builds and then they're gonna start skimming something off the top. The reason that this is troubling for publishers is that they are also running a test for publishers are part of this mix. So that it's not just you know the three of us, but it's also Business Insider and BuzzFeed and the New York Times and whoever else. And so all of the kind of prestige and uh, prestige, frankly, that the publishers like to think that they bring to the table is just flattened in this spreadsheet that a brand looks at. And that's, you know, whether that takes root and whether it really takes off and delivers, because to your point, it's, it's unclear whether that's going to result in content that's compelling enough for them to keep doing it, but Facebook's gonna try. Yeah. And that's the thing that I think bears paying attention to. I think, oh, sorry, and kind of to your point, um, 
I know we're, we're talking forward, but I think I was thinking about this when you were talking, Max. Um, I think a lot of the women's magazines have been hit really hard by the rise of yeah. influencer marketing. Yeah. Um, and that came up a lot when we were reporting on Condé Nast this summer. Um, a lot of people were saying, and we just saw Glamour, you know, is not going to be doing a print product anymore. And a lot of that is because, you know, the ad buyers were telling mm -hmm. me, well, why, why turn to that when the people who are buying this stuff can just follow their favorite person on Instagram and buy what they buy? Right. Mm -hmm. So we really have seen some of some flattening through this influencer marketing. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I think what the platforms are getting wrong also is that um, they're they're losing sight of they, they're very focused on their own platforms when in reality influencer marketing f spans platforms. Mm -hmm. So for some of you know in the kind of fashion beauty lifestyle space, we'll work with a lot of bloggers who still maintain their own owned properties, but then they're also distributing kind of unique spins on that content across multiple platforms. Mm -hmm. And so to get into a relationship with them requires us to have you know, licensing, in con in right. licensing deals and kind of very specific content usage that's specific to their assignment. And I just think that we're continuing to live in a diverse platform world. Um, it's not just Facebook. And this is, I mean, this is obviously Facebook has a very Facebook-centric worldview. Um, so I think it'll, it'll be interesting to see how kind of in concert, you know, Pinterest has its own thing going that's sort of similar of kind of a creator network that you can access. And yeah. now, you know, each, I think Facebook and Instagram have their own sort of things going. So it's just going to be, I think, limiting for, for them. I well, think what's fascinating too, is like you mentioned Pinterest, um, is Pinterest in a lot of ways should be a, pub, a platform that publishers love, right? Like Ooh. it's extremely visual. It's got a, a lot of ways you can monetize, whether it's, you know, by inserting advertisements and getting it cut, you could potentially, if you recommend something, there's a lot of shopping, you could potentially leverage an affiliate relationship there. But to your point, Pinterest doesn't even have like a publisher relations teams, right. you know, certainly relative to the, the massive ones that Facebook and, and Twitter and so on have. They are completely uninterested in the uh, kind of idea that uh, publishers are this sort of like elevated species that needs to be interacted with uh, in a special way. They would just much rather find the people that have auto organically developed a following on their platform and also, frankly, people that are not likely to you know, talk tough or demand things to go a certain way and they'll say, fine, we'll just work with them. These are our guys, we'll, we'll, go, with, you know, we'll go with that. So, <laughs> I mean, it may, it may seem obvious as it were, but just, um, I'm gonna come to questions in a second, but um, what's the kind of, you know, what are the um, ethical and regulatory issues that we're facing? Because it feels as though this, this is absolutely riddled with them. I know that, you know, something you, touched on some of this with the nano influencers and the, 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 the opportunity for exploitation on a number of levels. Yeah, the first, actually, on my beat, the first front page story I wrote at the Times was about the Kardashians and their... Congratulations. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Were you the first person readers. ever to get Sorry. the Kardashians <laughs> on A1 at the New York Times? Yeah, for a lot of their terrible disclosures. They weren't yeah. disclosing all these uh, ads on their Instagram. And, and it's kind of interesting. You would think the Kardashians would promote like more upscale products, but you know, they promote a lot of weight loss gummy bears and like fit tea, like a lot of, um, I guess, goop-esque uh, products. And so... Um, not that surprised, to be honest. Not but, that yeah. surprised, but they're, they're so high profile and they're doing this and it took a, you know, truth and advertising group to publicly, you know, call out to the FTC and then there's a whole back and forth and finally they started adding ad and sponsored. But, it's a good lesson, and if people that big aren't disclosing it, the incentives, so the FTC says anytime you get anything of monetary value, even a free gift, you have to disclose it in the post. And in a very clear way, not thanks Airbnb for the great vacation, it has to say hashtag sponsor or hashtag ad. And the thing is, advertisers like this because it doesn't feel like an ad, and so they don't want to actually say it that way. Um, and they, they've been very dodgy, and so the, FTC does not have a lot of people working there, and they've made you know a few different um, actions here. And so maybe, but really only a handful when you look at the fact there's millions of ad, hashtag ad, hashtag sponsored posts on Instagram. And so um, I would say it's very easy to not comply with the rules. The rules exist. Um, people know it's really easy to get away with, and there's a lot of incentive 
uh, to make the post more effective by not complying. So I think there's a lot of ethical issues. I think what's interesting about that, though, is that it, so much of what we're talking about is stuff that is pumped through the pipes of a platform, right? Mm -hmm. And we've seen that if Facebook doesn't want something on its platform, for the most part, it can tamp a lot of it down. Obviously, like the 1% that gets through is still a big scale, but if they were so inclined or were compelled to by the Federal Trade Commission or something, they would be able to cut that stuff out pretty quickly. I mean, one thing that I think is kind of instructive in this is um, the earlier panel I came in at the very end, I remember they mentioned George Takei, who made a nice business out of um, essentially sharing uh, publishers' content on Facebook for money. That was sort of an arbitrage opportunity that he and a bunch of other people found. But when Facebook figured this out and basically said, huh, someone is advertising on our platform without paying us, that's interesting. They basically squeezed all of the life out of the reach of those posts to the point that like, a, an entire business model that had started to build on Facebook was choked out of existence in the space of about 10 months. And if all of a sudden the FTC or the SEC said, this is, this is happening on your pipe, so it's your responsibility now, then all of a sudden every post that came out of one of these pages, if it mentioned any brand, you know, it would just automatically get piped into some sort of thing and the page manager would have to say, all right, this is going to sit grayed out until one of you can, you know, affirm that this is not a paid post in any way. And if you are lying to us or we find out that you're, you know, then we're going to choke all your engagement or your reach off uh, for six months. That would clean things up real quick. Because to your point, the FTC and the SEC do not have the manpower to like sift through the tidal wave of this stuff that's getting published every day. But the platforms do, and because they're you know, kind of central to all of it, it's interesting, that it'll be interesting to see whether or not they're forced to have a more prominent role in it. Yeah. Right, and or then, whether it's more profitable not to. Sorry, exactly, yes, Exactly, yeah, my, my, my take on it is actually that they wouldn't tamp it down so that you do the right thing. They tamp it down so that they can get an ad out of it. They can get oh, yeah. a, a budget for boosting out of it. And that there's going to be a little bit more kind of profit sharing in a way between right. the content creator who's making the thing and posting it organically, and then to actually get it in front of the wider yep. audience that the brand is really interested in. Like yep. to, Instead of throttling the reach, they'll you'll be able to, okay, you just, you know, X, XYZ budget, and then right. you'll actually get right. to that audience. It looks like this is an ad. Would you like to boost it? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, it's, they've created some products that allow them to start to get a handle on it. To so, start to get a handle yeah. on it, yes. And again, but this is just still just yeah. Facebook and, and Instagram that we're really talking about. There's a whole world. I mean, there's Twitch streamers in that so I was going, Yeah, we, I was going to say, we haven't even gone world, into gamers so, and, yeah. and Twitch, which again yeah. is like the fastest growing. I mean, you know, esports are yeah. huge. huge. It's so. kind of, yeah, and, and, and almost impossible to monitor. I mean, unless you're going to sit there and do it actually yeah. kind of, and, and, and in, you know, closed groups, things that are ephemeral and disappear. Yeah, that's true. All I mean, of it is built for really non regulation in a way. Potentially. I mean, I think this is why brands hire us, because brands who are concerned about like brand safety and digital marketing, they don't right. want to be on the wrong side of a New York Times piece that is an expose of you know, bad behavior. Well, they don't want to, they don't want Nobody them. wants that. Nobody <laughs> wants that, obviously. And so um, you know, I think we are in a unique position in that we're working with kind of the more responsible parties compared to some of the things that we're seeing. Um, there's a, a great Wired piece that an author in the room wrote about, yes, um, about kind of some startups and some of the kind of what's happening between, you know, kind of underhanded kind of stuff going on um, where they're encouraging certain behavior with amongst influencers. So, um, sorry, I'm being cagey about that because I think that you're probably going to talk about it. But, um, <laughs> Like good influencers, we like to preview the next yeah. panel before we finish <laughs> exactly. this one. Um, exactly. I was, I'm going to turn it over for questions now. So if, if people have questions, um, let's start here, then go there, then go there. So, in fact, two in the middle here. Down here, down here, down here. Hands up, guys. Okay. Hi, thank you for bringing everything up. And I, I have first a quick comment and then a question. Um, I come from a traditional media background. I've worked at Time Inc. and a lot of other big companies. And... Uh, I just have to say that um, when it comes to influencers versus quote unquote real journalists, um, there's no way that we are allowed to ethically. I mean, because there's a lot of um, paid expense, paid trips going on with these influencers that there's no way that any of us 
who were had come from a journalism background would be able to partake in. You, sh- you should have worked policies. in British journalism in the 90s, is all well, I can say. <laughs> well, ex- well, exactly. And also, just the fact that someone can get paid right. six figures right. to post something, uh, most managing editors don't even make uh, six figures. Yeah. Um, you know, just to post one thing, uh, that's, that's something that's completely off the table if for most established mainstream media uh, outlets. But my question is, I was wondering if anyone on the panel uh, could talk about um, any trends you might see regarding the privacy concerns issues that are coming up with Facebook and how they mine digital data for their users um, and how that affects maybe ad buys how that affects maybe you know any advertorial partners that you may have, uh, and not just Facebook, but I guess that's the most yeah. obvious example because that's great. Qu- that is a great question. So yeah, there's a lot happening. In in is 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 a current data privacy moves going to curb your business, Natalie, at all? Um, I don't think so, and quite the way. I mean. Uh, there was a, a breaking news today from Business of Fashion, which is, operates out of the UK, talking about how um, Cambridge Analytica actually weaponized likes for brands like Wrangler and um, another kind of American heritage brand, I think L.L. Bean, to sort of target Trump voters. So kind of basically triangulating different stuff that you can just see in the API if you are kind of a, a valid partner. Um, so in that way, it's sort of interesting. It's, I don't know if it's exactly, you know, going to threaten anybody's business or um, or cause challenges beyond like what we're seeing which is with you know issues with democracy but I think um, in terms of the influencer space da- audience data is continuing to be interesting to brands and so I think that does call into question like okay how are we making sure that that's anonymized as much as possible or are they keeping it in their walled garden versus letting you you know take it all out and manipulate it in other ways and connect it with other data sets so um, mm. it's unclear do you have a view on that, Samna, or Max? Um, the privacy concerns around Facebook have um, not sent advertisers away from it because they love the tools and they love what they get out of it. We haven't seen anyone pull ad buys, uh, and certainly not publicly, um, even in the wake of the, the big piece that the Times published on uh, some of the deception and denials going on behind the scenes at Facebook's executive levels. And and I think with Cambridge Analytica, what I was hearing from agencies and advertisers was fear that, I mean, they were like, we all have skeletons in the closet, was really the, the takeaway. So it, it scared them in terms of being associated with it. We certainly haven't seen money being pulled from those platforms. Okay. Um, yeah, then question here, then the, uh, question here, then there. Uh, who's got the mic? Microphone. Mm-hmm. Oh, sorry, if you give them the micro, no, down here. down here. Sorry. My pointing is very bad, or I'm being pointed to get. Just there. That's it. Um, so I think there's a, a really cool case study in a YouTube influencer called uh, Marquez Brunley. And so he has, he's a tech reviewer on YouTube, and he has more uh, subscribers than The Verge and Wired combined. Um, he and I, he produces what I call like real journalism. He reviews things. He interviews like VPs of Apple and Elon Musk. Uh, he doesn't take sponsored posts. And so, my question to you is: Do you, do you see that as not an uh, not a isolated incident, but something where influencers are gravitating towards, or at least the high end of them, where they are their own essentially media companies mm. rather than? Um, uh, vessels right. or commerce it's, and things like that? It's, uh, yes, the uh, Alex Jones, Jones effect. <laughs> it's, I mean, I think that there's a lot of them. I think Marcus Brownlee is kind of fascinating, um, partly because I know a bunch of publishers have tried to sort of like bring him into their umbrellas, basically say like, Let's, we'll pay you a ton of money to affiliate yourself formally with us. Uh, 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 overtures that he has, I guess, sort of rejected. But um, yeah, I mean, I think you already see that happening. I mean in a certain way, like that's sort of what Goop is, isn't it? I mean, Goop is a giant media empire that was built out of the recommendations, the you know, heartfelt recommendations that Gwyneth Paltrow put into a newsletter. Um, uh, you would, maybe to a lesser extent, there's sort of apples and oranges, but th- there was this um, business that the journal f- uh, spotlighted a couple days ago called Ladder, which is like built out of a protein supplement that LeBron James started taking um, that his personal chef design for him after he started cramping up after game one of the NBA finals. Like what all of this is sort of like 
kind of emanating out of is the fact that anything, any person that is able to amass like a big audience on the internet can, can monetize it basically. Um, you know, whether you amass it by looking good in a swimsuit or like reviewing the hell out of speakers or, you know, hard drives doesn't really matter. Like if, if you've got a lot of people that check up on you all the time, then you can make money off of that. And how you do it is completely up to you. you it can be as, as scrupulous or unscrupulous as you like. Uh, 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 as the microphone's here, we'll do here first. Yeah, and then out there, and then over there. This is a, a technical question. But Facebook has this, uh, um, has this bot What's happening. Right. Your uh, um, disinformation. No, the FTC has really put the onus on brands to police it, not even... They really, they've done a little bit on the influencers themselves, but a lot of it has been on the brands um, and not the platforms. And even in cases, um, I wrote a story about bot likes. If any of you have ever had a public Instagram account, you've probably had a weird like or comment from someone, some random account that's like, cool photo or nice pic. And this is, this problem has reduced a little bit, but people were paying for, I think someone mentioned fraudulent engagement maybe on the first uh, panel, Ooh, yes. but that's what that is. Like people will yeah. pay for bots to go around and like and comment on posts, hoping to get that engagement in return to make their posts more valuable. And even in that case, Instagram, like it seems like you have a lot of really brilliant people working there. Like perhaps if they made that a priority, they could have shut that down. Uh, but they did with some companies, but it was very shadowy. They didn't really make a lot of public statements about it or really any. So um, we haven't seen that conversation, I don't think, happen um, in terms of whether it's their responsibility. And I also don't think from what we've seen that they would proactively do that either. We're going to probably be, be talking much more about that in the next panel. Um, I have time for like just one more question. I know you don't want me to ask one, but I'm going to. Yes, right down here. Because I'm a bad chair. Make it um, snappy, otherwise I'll be in massive trouble. Thank you very much for all of you showing up. I was just asked, I just wanted to ask uh, the panel or anyone specifically about the quality versus quantity model when it comes to influencers. So you'll see brands like Squarespace just hocking up all of this space in any YouTube, uh, any YouTuber or, or it just, it, I, for me specifically, I just know Squarespace is the big one. So what's your opinion with regards to quantity of however many influencers versus quality of really picking a couple of really nice, really good influencers online? Well, I, I think the crazy thing is it's all over the place. I mean, you are seeing, and the thing is a lot of this comes out in lawsuits because it's such an opaque market. So Fire Festival, I think, was a huge watershed moment. Our favorite. Right? Yeah. It's what's does that, what a does disaster. Anyone here, does anyone here go to Fire Festival? Oh my gosh, I hope not. Oh yeah, but I mean, from, from that debacle, we saw the, the tens of thousands of dollars people were getting paid literally for a single post. And um, just you know, a couple months ago, Luca Sabat, I may not even be saying that right, uh, a model, male model on Instagram, mm. he didn't comply with the terms of a, to me, I know we were talking about a lot of the labor that goes into these posts, but to me, it seemed like quite a good deal to get paid $60,000 for like, three Instagram stories and two static posts and to be photographed. I mean, that's a, that's a lot of money when you think about $60,000, you know, being an entry level salary in journalism, like a pretty decent one. I'm in the wrong line of work. Oh, right, in a lot of places. <laughs> I think the so, wrong line of work. Um, I guess, sorry, to me, yes. I, I think the, that quantity, quality uh, calculation is totally all over the place. I talked to brands using nano influencers and then you have the people paying Lucas Sabat, uh, which was Snapchat in that yeah. case, paying $60,000 for four Instagram posts. So ju yeah. just very quickly, and I am finishing now, just on that money point, how much, what's the scale? So a nano influencer will get paid how much? Free products. Free products. Them, that's why they're right. so lucrative. Right. And somebody who none of us have ever heard of, but who is a very powerful influencer would get what? Six figures. Uh, like someone with 30,000 I talked to, yep. the Thai guy, he charges $500 per Instagram post. $500 for putting on a tie. Okay. Mm. 
it's pretty good. I, I'd, um, I'd argue there's a lot more that goes into it, but yes, I mean. It, okay, it's, sorry, yeah. not just putting on a tie. Like, it's okay, but I think that's the that's the with an art the temptation in the room. is to think that's what yeah. it is, and, okay. and for you know, there's there's just a huge range of kinds of creators. Right. So I, 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 I it's, withdraw. It's to be fair, my advertising remarks. has always pulled in more money than right. journalism, so I guess sure. that's the the difficult yes. thing. Of course, if you compare it to a freelance rate for the style section of the New York yeah. Times, it's going to look like a really. It's bad always comparison. pulled in more money than journalism, but then it does actually give some of the money back to journalism right. and so that I guess is what we're going to talk about in our next panel. Um, this has been fascinating. Thank you so much um, you. for your insight and questions. And we have a quick seven minute comfort break and then I will hand over to my colleague uh, Mark Hansen um, at the back and he will take you through the last panel. Nice meet you. Writing those crazy profiles. Yes, yes exactly. Yeah. That. That I was listening to the archives back with Mark Hansen. So I was like deep in the dark archives. No, I know. I just put some just for the book. Yeah, Oh, 
Great to meet. Yes, I was going to say I still feel like I know you, kind of all from you know the the, 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 the nice scrolling. Yeah. Yes, exactly the nice part. Of the <laughs> but no, it's great to meet you as well. And uh, I'm, I may I may have an agency voice. You know, I know that obviously with some journalism. No, no, but I think it's like, it's always important to have people from the business, and we want it. We really want someone from the platforms here, and. Um, so we got someone, and then it was like, I have the info, I have the flu, which might be true. That's the flu. No, not not the flu. Like it's not the flu. They've I had mean, a bad few weeks. Yeah, I was going to say, they've had a bad week. If I was, if I was their mom, if I, honestly, if I was their comms person, I would be like, no, 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 no. You're going to be listening yeah. to uh, You're going to be on the panel apologize with... apologize for, like, hijacking the... No, no, that was all right. That's a good, no, that was a good question. Yeah, it was a good question. Yeah, I was talking about the whole break of shindig.
refresh the water even? Look at that. All right, I don't see George, but I I think we might I think we might start perhaps Maybe <laughs> Okay, we'll get going. There you go. See if you see it forcefully enough. There we go. <laughs> um, so with last panel of the evening, you are all very brave. It's late and you're probably quite hungry and the food's sitting there ominously under a towel. So um, uh, my name is Mark Hansen. I direct the Brown Institute here and I'm very pleased to be um, hosting this panel this evening. I think what we'll do first, uh, I'll play uh, um, uh, sort of lazy moderator as my other uh, two <laughs> co-moderators have done um, and uh, have uh, uh, Becca who's a PhD student at Stanford, um, uh, Mia who's a research fellow at Tau and Paris who's a staff writer for Wired. Take a moment and just introduce yourselves and then I have a few questions to ask. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Mia Shuangli. Uh, I used to be a, a reporter in China, uh, first for a state paper and then for the Beijing Bureau of the Times. Um, and then I am now a research fellow at the Tao Center looking at digital media in China. Uh, hi, my name is Paris Martineau. I'm a staff writer at Wired where I cover social media manipulation, online extremism, and internet culture. Hi, I'm Becca Lewis. I am a PhD student at Stanford and also an affiliated researcher at the Data and Society Research Institute. Uh, and I also study the far right and uh, uh, specifically far right uh, celebrities and influencers. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. So, my, I think maybe to get started, um, because uh, uh, Emily's already alluded to our, our, our class, and we try to get our students to. Uh, have a look at some of these um, some of these sort of shadowy networks that propagate information in one way or another, um, and try to teach them some of the tool sets that 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 um, help them conduct those investigations. And along the way, there are always I always come away from the semester with a story or two, like something about oh we discovered this group that's doing this or that. So I would like you all, each of you, to maybe tell me your favorite story about some connected group or some, some, something that, um, some, some way of um, maybe coordinating or, or something that surprised you along the way uh, as you've done the research and the reporting that you've done. Um, okay, my favorite story is this. When it comes to influencers in China, the way I see it, that um, there's more similarities between China and the US in terms of uh, using social media and getting clout. Uh, uh, online. Uh, there's really more similarities than differences between the US and China. Um, but there's two things that are striking when it comes to uh, influencers in China. The first one is just the sheer numbers. Um, so if you have a, a few million followers, don't even rank in terms of influencers in China. So Chinese influencers, um, when they look at uh, their counterparts in the US, they're like, oh, you get brand deals for like a million followers? In China, you need to at least 20 or 50. Um, the, second thing, the second thing is that, um, so the, um, in, in China, the contrast between legacy media um, and social media in terms of vibrancy and fun is much starker than the US because of the censorship issue. The analogy I always tell people is that if you think Chinese legacy media um, in terms of fun and vibrancy is like a windowless unfurnished basement and then social media is six flags. It's, it's that kind of contrast. But I think in a lot of the things that are happening in China is slowly coming to the US. Uh, for example, a certain level of political apathy, uh, news fatigue, um, 
uh, so much so that um, uh, th uh, there's a Chinese app that's gain getting a lot of popularity in the U.S. How many of you know this app called TikTok? Yeah. Yeah, it's a Chinese app, and I tried and failed three times to figure out why. Apparently, the average uh, user length on that app is. Um, two hours something? I have no idea how <laughs> people spend hours on that thing. Um, so that's, that's where the differences stops. And the similarities, um, uh, my favorite, uh, is that um, once uh, social media influencers have more clout than legacy media, um, you see them using it not just to sway the purchasing choices of consumers, but they also use it for social causes, for uh, social commentary, for political uh, commentary, and for, for activism. So my favorite story is, um, it used to be that in China, nobody paid any attention to the, to the air pollution problem. People have, the sky is gray, people have thought that the sky has always been gray, um, until there was one influencer who is a real estate developer on this app called Weibo. Um, who had, I think at the time, 25 million followers. And people follow him uh, for real estate tips. Um, suddenly one day he said, um, this air in China is really bad. And that's when people started paying attention to air quality. Mm -hmm. And he was the first one ever, not the government, not media, not NGOs, not activists, have ever mentioned the idea of a PM 2.5. He mentioned it, and then overnight, everyone knew what PM 2.5 is. Um, so that's my favorite story, and I think um, there will come a day where um, s social media influencers would have considerable sway um, over, uh, more, pro probably even more than legacy media. And did his influence go up or down after the PM 2.5? Wait, that's the thing. Another thing in China is once you have influence, um, uh, it raises your profile, and that's a double-edged sword. Um, later, that uh, this we call it we call them big Vs, which basically just verified accounts. Um, and he was he was silenced, and he refer resurfaced later and just stop talking about um, social issues. Um, yeah, but that's another thing. Uh, so when business in the US are thinking about how do we measure uh, influence on social media, and in China that's a problem for the state because they need to, they don't want people to organize. Um, so for years, uh, the business side have thought about, okay, how is the Chinese state going to um, rein in the influencers on social media? So we, th we think, oh, maybe they'll go by the number of followers. Uh, maybe they'll go by reach with the number of followers of their followers. Maybe they'll look at how produced the content is. Um, they will look at how many teams work on one social media handle. But um, just a week ago, the state has drawn the line in the sand. The state says, um, it's your influence, they're very result oriented. They said your influence is defined by the, your ability to sway and mobilize, uh, to sway public opinion and mobilize socially. So that's the Chinese state's definition of uh, influence on social media. And I think that's very, effective and a lot of uh, businesses uh, or marketing companies d define social media. I think we'll come back to that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, probably one of the most interesting stories I've ever worked on. It started back in like March or February. I happened, like one of my sources had mentioned that um, like they'd noticed kind of a network of accounts. There was some primary or maybe gubernatorial elections going on in the U.S. And they'd noticed um, a network of accounts all with maybe like tens of thousands of followers really active in the uh, ultra right wing space or on, twi on Twitter. Um, they were all tweeting kind of like fake news or similar like messages um, that kind of were on the line of like propaganda and just like, oh, pro sorry. Um, this is this better? They were 
so there was this network of accounts that was all spreading um, kind of ultra-right-wing propaganda. And as I was looking into it, I realized that all these accounts that all had tens of thousands of followers, they were all connected to one account. It's called the Bradford File, which had, I think at the time, hundreds of thousands of followers on Twitter and was basically every crazy right-wing propaganda point you could imagine, but in one account, tweeted hundreds if not thousands of times a day and uh, wielded massive influence. And I think I wrote some story, I wrote some story kind of about that tied to the elections and it was the only time, one of the first times that I think I was working for the outline, which was a smaller media outlet then, and we were absolutely overwhelmed with like pushback from thousands and thousands of accounts in this giant network. So of course we ended up looking into it more. Um, this process took a couple of months because then the Cambridge Analytica thing happened and all the tech news kind of uh, took a break for a second from anything else. But I ended up um, finding a lot of the people behind it and looking into this account and it turns out that it not only was a Twitter account, but it had a series of serialized video games and apps that had merch. It had its own like web service system attached to it. It had all these different ways to try and monetize and influence and uh, was trying to design its own news apps and things like that. And I ended up eventually talking to uh, the founder, the person behind it, whose name was Bradford himself, and we talked for hours, kind of trying to figure out how he had kind of created what seems like a, an influence network, because there were these hundreds of thousands of accounts amplifying his content at every hour of the day, and he denied it all. Uh, I ended up find, luckily, during that week, there was um, a defection in their two-person team, and the person, he and his co-creator got in an argument and he called the cops on him, so he was much more willing to talk. And he ended up telling me that this guy, the Bradford File, had essentially created this uh, network of Twitter DM rooms, where essentially he had, um, it was mostly women actually, very popular women in kind of MAGA Twitter that all had crushes on him and he would flirt with them in the same room in exchange for them retweeting and amplifying his content as well as pay for uh, amplification. And I thought that it was such an interesting look into how all of these different forces combine to spread inf misinformation and uh, increasingly polarized content. So, so the, 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 the network of followers was sort of bought free, this was just, this was purely a, a self-built, um, self-flirted. Um, <laughs> I mean, so the thing is, there was, I mean, he had hundreds of thousands of followers technically, but the majority of his actual engagement came from enlisting other people with actually real followings to retweet his content. Whenever his content didn't happen to get a lot of retweets from his core group, uh, it kind of fell flat and he wasn't ever He'd had all these kind of um, business attempts where he tried to, you know, like had all these video games or things like that that he tried to monetize, but no one, no brands would ever sponsor him or buy into it because they could see that it was just like a, a stack of nesting dolls and that he was not the real one with influence, rather he was kind of weaponizing the influence of others. Uh, so for the past couple of years, my colleagues at Data and Society and I have been looking specifically at far-right influencers on YouTube. And I think a lot of people are surprised to hear that uh, there are open white supremacists and neo-Nazis who have uh, tens of thousands and sometimes hundreds of thousands of followers uh, on YouTube. And uh, they kind of have this network of um, collaboration, like any uh, network of influencers, where they'll show up in each other's content, they'll promote each other's ideas, they'll debate with each other. And uh, what we started to find was that there are kind of some more mainstream political influencers who kind of can lead people down this rabbit hole to more extremist content. Um, so I don't know if this is my favorite story, but one thing that I found was really fascinating was, you know, we had been studying this content for, you know, probably a year uh, at this point when uh, a tiny account by Kanye West tweeted that uh, he was a fan of someone named Candace Owens. And uh, I'm, was anyone familiar with kind of Kanye West's, uh, <laughs> some nodding people, <laughs> his uh, differing political views? So he uh, has kind of always been outspoken, but over the course of the past year, he started to um, 
say more and more right wing views, and they start they were really coming to reflect this uh, worldview and this content uh, that was the same thing we would see with people getting radicalized through these YouTube videos. And Candace Owens, who he tweeted about, is a far-right influencer who uh, works with a group called Turning Points USA, which is a conservative uh, group on college campuses. And um, she has you know, quite a big following on YouTube. So uh, it was this really interesting moment where kind of mainstream celebrity intersected with uh, online YouTube celebrity. And it was all about this kind of far right radicalization. Um, Kanye has since removed himself from it, but it was presumably over a branding deal for uh, t-shirt designs that he didn't like. Um, and it, it's unclear to what extent he uh, actually was removing himself from uh, you know, the debate because he didn't like the politics of the people he was with. But um, that was a moment in time where it was kind of interesting to see all of these different aspects playing with each other. So it seems, uh, especially in the last two examples, there's, there's, a, there's a fair bit of, of, you know, sort of tracking across, across the network, figuring out who's connected to who, figuring out what, how, how, how do you do, how, what are your research methods kind of at scale? How do you get a sense of, of this is an interesting group, this is something that, that, that um, is, is maybe something amounting more to just, the, to than just a network curiosity? Because some of the work that, that we've done in class and other places, you know, you'll, you'll get to these curious corners and you're like, well, that's just strange. Like, I don't know why that would be. And you can't quite figure out why why, like why it's important or what's there. So, so what, are the, what are the tools that you use to, to, to kind of tease apart these networks and, and, and decide that they're important or that there's something interesting here going on? Sure, yeah, so, um, so as I was mentioning, you know, we, we started to find that collaboration was a really powerful tool for these influencers. So what would happen is, you know, someone that is, uh, not a white nationalist, but is anti-feminist and anti-Islam uh, would have a channel and they would invite someone onto their channel uh, who is a white nationalist and they would have a conversation and it would be friendly. And at the end, even though the original influencer is not themselves a white nationalist, they would encourage their followers, go like and subscribe to uh, this other person's channel. Um, and this is, again, this is kind of them ad adopting uh, you know, normal YouTube influencer strategies, right? Um, if you look at like how to build up your YouTube channel 101 types of articles, they will always say collaborate with other YouTubers because you can build off each other's audiences. Um, and so I got kind of really fixated on this idea that people were getting radicalized not only through the YouTube algorithm, which I think there's a lot of uh, research happening uh, around that, but through these collaborations. Um, the tricky thing about that is that YouTube doesn't provide any meta metadata about these collaborations. So I actually manually collected data, starting with uh, the seed account of Dave Rubin, who is a popular member of uh, what's known as the Intellectual Dark Web, uh, which is this group of kind of professors and, and pundits and media personalities who are kind of anti-social justice. And, uh, and then just did this snowball approach. I looked at everyone who had appeared on his show and everyone who had appeared on their shows and so on until uh, there was this cohesive network that got formed um, and made a network graph out of that. Um, and what became clear through that process, it kind of confirmed the hypothesis that we had that people could kind of start with a more mainstream channel and end up on a much more uh, extremist channel, not only through the YouTube recommendation algorithm, but also just by getting uh, exposure to other content through collaborations. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, but about the collaborations phenomenon, I have this analogy. I feel like two uh, collaborations between two influencers are like a same-sex marriage. Because you get married, you double your wardrobe. <laughs> and then you still have that one jacket, but you both have that jacket. It's that's uh, yeah. that's a good point. It's about yeah, sure. combining yeah. audiences and building off of like people will see it as a coup when they can uh, get a certain really popular influencer on their channel, right, or vice versa. Um, you'll you'll get audience members kind of. Um, in the comments saying to an influencer, hey, you really should go on this person's channel. And they'll say, you know, oh, I would love to go on their channel. Why don't you, as commenters, ask them to have me on? And then it becomes this interplay where, you know, they're, 
their fans kind of do work for them to, to help them build their own audiences. Yeah, and then both of them, even if they don't end up collaborating, they get boosts from the fact that they're boosting their own engagement by their fans commenting on their stuff. Absolutely, Vice yeah. versa, which in turn gives them more power based on like the algorithms of sites like YouTube or Instagram or even Twitter. Um, I don't know, when I've done this sort of work before, I, as far from a data side, I generally try and partner with um, researchers in order to get a better look at Twitter's API. Um, one thing, whenever I'm kind of trying to find a, a network of accounts, there are actually some good third-party tools out there. I'm forgetting the name, but if you just like Google around for like, I don't know, like tracking how many retweets or something, they can only pull up to the 2,000 that Twitter lets you pull at once, which when you're talking about, um, I don't know, these sort of uh, power players, 2,000 might be like two days worth of tweets. Um, but with researchers, generally, I'll try and like pull um, data from a certain user um, for maybe a couple of weeks at a time over a period of like months and then from there we can see like okay these 400 like these like 200 accounts are consistently like retweeting or interacting with their content and then all of and those accounts are retweeting and interacting with other people's content like 400 to 600 times a day that kind of seems like it's sort of automated activity um, and then you kind of can go in from there and see what the connections are Generally when I'm, I don't know, when I fall into like these weird rabbit holes, I just spend like hours and hours like Googling things and like going on archive, uh, the internet archive and kind of looking back because, I don't know, you may think that like, okay, you'll never know who this mysterious person is on Twitter or YouTube or something, but everybody always makes like one mistake at some point and leaves one tiny clue of a location or a photo or maybe registered trademark once and you can find like that, then you can peel out the rest of it. I, I'm interested following up on, on the Chinese government's uh, uh, d definition of influencers based on sway and mobilization or the ability to mobilize. I know one of the things when I've, when I've seen studies of misinformation or whatever, the, the thing that always, the, the question I always have is, well, you know, how do we actually get at the impact? Like we can compute reach, we can compute, there's a lot of things we can compute, like a lot of, this many eyeballs saw it, but what was the real impact of all of that? Um, uh, how, how, I guess maybe starting with, with, with you, Mia, how, how, how does the, the Chinese government reckon it's gonna measure, uh, measure sway and, and mobilization? Right, because um, these influencers, uh, they, they want the power, but they don't want the responsibility. So they, they accumulate all these followers but uh, when it comes to responsibility, they say, I'm just a user. This is just a regular user handle on this platform. I can't help it if people follow me. Um, and sometimes they call themselves opinion leaders in, in that they, they say, I'm not the leader, it's my opinion. Um, people agree with my opinion, so they're following my opinion, not me personally. Um, so, but we just, um, because there's so much money in the in the in the influencers and marketing industry, um, there's um, the industry has been waiting for years to see how the Chinese government uh, is going to rein in um, this kind of influence, which is growing stronger and stronger, surpassing legacy media, um, and um, so. You, there's lots of guesses and say, oh, it's by the, num the number of people on your production team, is by how professional your content looks like, how polished um, your, your content looks like. But turns out that um, I think the Chinese state is very smart in that they only care about the result. They don't care even if you have the influence, they don't care if you don't use it. So. Um, for example, if something happens, if there's a street protest somewhere and they can trace it back to an influencer, um, they would say you mobilized socially. Um, or uh, if someone said something and changed public opinion on the public issue and the government can say um, you're responsible for swaying public opinion. So I think that's where they finally put their um, foot down and say, um, you're, it's, it's an attempt to get influencers to, to self-censor and say, you have the power, 
we're gonna force responsibility on you. If anything happens, you're responsible for it. And how about Twitter? Like, how do you how do you measure sort of the impact that somebody's that somebody's had? Is that a that's a thing that I think about all the time, whether it's even Twitter or Insta any platform. There is no real way to measure influence at all, which is kind of paradoxical because we talk about it like it is this measurable thing. And in some ways it is. You know, you have like follower counts, likes, uh, the amount of times people are tweeting once somebody uses a word, how many other people use that word in the platform. But all of those things could be bought technically, all of them could be automated, all of them could be real users who have like signed up and decided, okay, I'm going to retweet this person's content this amount of times a day, or I'm going to, you know, share it on Instagram or on a different platform. And I, I mean, so platforms like Twitter and Instagram and all of them, they have, I guess, made efforts to curb this sort of engagement manipulation or falsification but it's still rampant and I can kind of understand why because they have no real incentive to cut down on it because why would they want to make it look like less people are using and engaging with their platform? And also because we love to look at a tweet and be like, wow, look, my tweet has like a couple hundred likes. People must love me, you know? You want to be able to uh, have these metrics to measure worth by, but the reality is that even though we view these as measures of authenticity, they're the farthest thing from that. Or just AI will do it. That's <laughs> <laughs> That's the Mark Zuckerberg answer, right? AI will <laughs> solve all of the, our problems. They'll figure out what to measure it. And, and Becca, at the, like in your in your research, so you know, as 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 you've gone through YouTube, do, is it is it a, is it a survey process to sort of see what what sorts of misinformation campaigns or what have you are, are effective, or or, um, or 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 is it does it sort of stop at like sort of mapping the network and, and having a look there? So it depends, because I think, you know, when you're talking about uh, political advertising, essentially what that is is propaganda, right? Um, and the, the histories of uh, political propaganda and advertising are pretty intertwined um, to the point that sometimes they're uh, indistinguishable. Um, so I, I think about the influence that they're wielding somewhat in terms of like the advertising terms. So, you know, what's the equivalent of converting someone into a, a buyer of a product in this case? And I think it varies. I mean, leading up to the 2016 election, a lot of the disinformation campaigns from the far right online were built with the, um, the express purpose of getting people to vote for Donald Trump or in some cases to not vote at all, to just you know, uh, expand the, the distrust in American institutions. Um, now I think it's a little bit um, trickier. I think in some cases people are literally just trying to, to share their ideology with the world and get, you know, convince other people to, to hold that ideology. And as a researcher, that's almost impossible to, to measure. Uh, so what we have to rely on is looking at like, uh, the, the comments of audience members and what they uh, say about YouTubers in other contexts. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, in, uh, um, this is quite a depressing way to, to see the influence, but in a couple of the violent attacks that have happened recently, um, when you look at the media that they were consuming, some of it was, you know, the same media that we're researching. And so you could say that this is actually one form of influence that the that media was wielding. Um, and so, so it's tricky. It's tricky to, to measure that influence. Um, but, you know, there is, you kind of have to piece it together from a bunch of different places. So if it, if it, if it sort of focused on getting a, attention or sharing your message, post-2016, what can we expect for 2020? Like what are, have you started to see any ripples or any, because I, I feel like it's probably got to take a little time to get some of these networks built up. And so I think what was interesting in, in 2016 was you had a lot of communities online, at least in the far right, you had a lot of communities that were coming together for the first time and they were working across groups. So you had men's rights activists who were kind of focused mostly on anti-feminism. You had white nationalists, you had just kind of general Trump supporters and they were all, even though they didn't always agree with each other, they were kind of working across lines to, with a common goal of getting Trump elected. Um, 
But then with that, they kind of built these structures into place online, and I think now you have a system that's kind of a well-oiled machine. And the, the far-right influencers on YouTube, they have a content creation system now. There are specific genres that they know they can go to. There are um, separate news cycles that happen within there where you know one influencer in that network will say something that has a ripple effect that everyone else comments on. Um, so in some ways, I think that their structure is kind of ready and in place for whatever happens in 2020. Um, they just need a candidate to to get behind. Well, I mean, I, I guess for the presidential candidate, it's already there, but um, uh, you know, whoever else is there, as things ramp up um, and as a Democratic candidate emerges, then there will be disinformation campaigns about that and, and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, all of these, uh, the strategies that these groups are using when, I guess, one gets found out by Facebook or Twitter and they shut down the accounts, it's not like these groups just stop. They say, oh, they know that we are doing X, we're going to do Y, then, and then until Instagram or Twitter or whatnot figures out that, they'll continue to do it and proliferate while working on five or six other strategies. It's, even though a certain uh, means of achieving that end has stopped, they're still going to try their hardest to influence and uh, weaponize these kind of structures that they have uh, put so much effort into. And that's one thing that I've found, I guess, I was going to say interesting, that's the wrong word, I guess disturbing is about when Twitter released all of that data uh, maybe a month or so ago of um, Iranian and uh, uh, Russian accounts from the Internet Research Agency and the activities they were doing leading up to the 2016 election, I mean, almost of that, like, there were millions and millions of tweets, like five or nine million or something like that, but it was almost all like pre-2016 stuff was all the new information, very little new information from 2016 to 2018. Um, and it's because we're just now figuring out the breadth of what these bad actors did in you know, 2014. We're going to have no idea what they are doing currently, probably until 2025, 2023, hopefully we will, but it doesn't seem wise. And so what is the asymptote there? So I know like in a, in a bot world, the, you, know, you, you build a bot, they kill a bot, so you teach your bot to sleep so they don't kill it, and then they find, oh, it's tweeting too much, so then they kill the bot. Mm -hmm. um, and so you build a bot that tweets a little less and goes to sleep, and, and then they kill it, and you, so you build a bot that goes to sleep a little less, or sorry, tweets a little less, goes to sleep at different hours of the day. Like, you're asymptoting to like, sort of yeah. like, you know, human looking behavior, right? It, it, what, what is, what are the, you know, in, the, in that cycle of getting shut down, starting up again, getting shut down, starting up again, what are, what, what are, what are these accounts asymptoting to in terms of how they look? I think they're, I, I guess like one good example, um, one of my, the research that I, I worked with when I was looking through this data set that Twitter released um, had pointed this out to me. I think, so, of like a network, I'm pretty sure it was like Iranian accounts that had been like shut down time and time again. Um, then one of the accounts that was identified as Iranian was shut down. Uh, it only had two tweets, I believe. It was like at two in the morning, and one, the first one was like, it's cold outside. The other one was like, it's a nice day to go for a bike ride, and then it was shut down. So obviously, it wasn't the uh, actual content that Twitter had flagged, but rather maybe an IP address or something. So I think they're, if we are talking about maybe automated accounts in a sense, they're just trying to see what will not get shut yeah. down and then learning from that and then building a better machine. But oftentimes, um, I think the word bot is a bit of a misnomer because a, the more effective campaigns are not automated in a way, but rather like run by a team of people like any legitimate social media campaign would be if you are a real influencer, you know, whatever we want to call a real influencer. But, um, all right, we should take questions because George is in the back tap dancing. Uh, is there a question? Maybe we'll start at the front and move back here in the black. I think one of the interesting points to look at between conflict, conflict zones between influencers and journalism, uh, particularly the way that a lot of alternate influencers use decontextualized mainstream journalism for recruitment and sort of ideological development. Um, 
And one of the phenomenons that's really interesting is the ratio uh, and review bombing. Uh, I was wondering if that figures into how influencers might talk about this internally, but also from a publishing perspective, how that's dealt with from a major publication. Hmm. But everyone should care about their ratio. Like, that's another thing is, um, it's, uh, in China and the US, uh, like, uh, social, your social media is slowly becoming a status symbol. Uh, so, for example, in China, if you apply for a loan, uh, the bank might even look at how many followers you have and what kind of followers they are, what's their average spending. Um, they, they see all this on your phone. They see what kind of phone you use. Um, I think, yeah, I care about my ratio. <laughs> um, with micro-influencers, I think um, this is going to be something that everyone has to worry about. <laughs> Yeah, I oh sorry. Can I go ahead? Oh, yeah, I was just going to add on to what you were saying, but um I think from yeah, publisher perspective there is this off there's, there's this trend of kind of weaponizing a certain amount of like content that was originally perhaps uh taken in a totally different light and then using it to fulfill an alternative purpose. Um I can't remember the specific thing, but in regards to the whole migrant <coughs> caravan uh hailstorm of propaganda and misinformation. There was a video of um, perhaps some like immigrants, it was not even related to the migrant caravan, who were in a truck, and then uh, a lot of groups online repurposed that um, with a head that seemed like it was from that news organization saying, oh yeah, the caravan is totally walking, right? Look at them in this truck. But a lot of people generally just look at it and see that and take it for what it is rather than it would be too much work to go to the website, see if that actually exists, and disprove it. So, uh, and social media is kind of built just for that instant, you know, share rather than fact checking. Hi, this is a question, I guess, for Becca or Paris. Um, in terms of your research, what do you have specific strategies for protecting yourself personally? Um, and I'm just thinking generally about whether or not people come after you once they realize that you're poking around, and or just the fact that when I'm in class and I show you, like I showed a flat earth YouTube video once in class, and then I had flat earth YouTube videos popping up all the time on the feed, and I was just completely freaked out because just looking at some of this stuff, I felt that the algorithms were gonna start sending me tons more. And I'm just wondering, do you have ways of compartmentalizing your interactions with this stuff, and do you have specific self-protective strategies that you use? Yeah, I think it's funny, actually, around the, the ratio conversation. I've come around on ratios <laughs> now that I've seen how much they can be weaponized against me specifically, <laughs> um, because uh, after publishing research on this far-right network of influencers, um, a, a ton of them did, you know, kind of try to organize quite a bit of harassment against me. Um, luckily, you know, the organization that I worked at, Data and Society, uh, has worked on these issues for a few years now. And, you know, I think uh, we ended up getting kind of a, a crash course beforehand in like preventative steps for security and all of that. So, you know, there's a lot of great like DIY security, uh, manuals online that I would highly recommend um, if, you, if you're interested in getting in, interested in this work. Um, but I think it was also fascinating just to see, you know, I'm a researcher and so I was approaching the reactions as a researcher and it was interesting to see how they attempted to mobilize um, against research that was done about them and how they kind of landed on certain strategies to try to discredit the, the research that was done about them. Um, and then the, the last thing that I'll say is, you know, it, it definitely, doing this kind of research is a mental health strain, and more than anything, it has uh, made me really interested in the work of content moderators and um, kind of the, the precarity of their work because they're some of the least valued workers in Silicon Valley, but they spend their days looking at this content and a range of other, you know, extremely graphic, awful content. Um, and, you know, as much as Mark Zuckerberg says that things are going to get solved with AI, 
Uh, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. And so much of this stuff is deeply contextual, right? Like, um, uh, a lot of the influencers on YouTube, they know exactly what they can and cannot stay, say to be able to stay up. Um, so a lot of them will explicitly not use racial slurs, but they have very sophisticated dog whistles that they're still seeing extremely uh, racist content. So in some cases, you really need a human there to, to do that content moderation work, but that's really taxing work. And uh, I think it's something that Silicon Valley needs to pay more attention to. Yeah, as far as like specific tactics, I've been, um, I try to on a semi-weekly basis uh, try and put myself in the shoes of, okay, if <coughs> I want to like dox myself, like find out my personal information, like how would I best do it? And I just like spend hours like Googling or going to, all, there's a lot of, you know, different sites that scalp uh, information. Luckily, I grew up in Florida and Florida has an open records law, so all of my old information from when I lived there uh, overshadows any of the new information from New York that I've hidden. Um, but I mean, you can, I've like gone through all of the uh, sites that will publish your voter record information, um, information about you personally, and then you can go through a very complicated process of calling all of them to get it taken down. There's also a good service that I just heard about this week from a coworker. It's called Delete Me, I believe. I think yes, it's like so good. $100 and you, <laughs> <coughs> um, our editor chief, like I heard him going through it uh, the other day on the phone, but they will scrub you from the internet, which is helpful. Um, whenever, yeah, if I'm looking at particularly uh, toxic material, sometimes I'll use like Tor or something to one anonymize myself, but two so that it doesn't follow me around the internet forever. But I guess as a weird person, I've like kind of enjoyed the weird uh, effects of all the strange stuff I look at from work ending up in my advertising profile because then I'm shown increasingly strange things by Facebook and Instagram. Like, I've probably written 15 or more stories that have come from a strange Instagram ad or something Facebook has shown me for some reason that's promoted content. So it kind of feeds back into itself. The, uh, the topic of uh, measuring influence is fascinating. You touched on it earlier. Uh, solutions in the, uh, in the e-commerce space, uh, our commercial affiliate, affiliate links, like that. If there's any compelling research out there on uh, mapping how ideas spread uh, beyond likes and shares, so things like sentiment analysis or actual vocabulary mapping, if there's anything you guys have come across that you feel like sharing. Sometimes there's a clue in the comment. Sometimes you see a random user suddenly follow the different account, and they would say, who and who sent me here? Or they give you, a, and then you go back to the who and who, and you see what kind of content led to this user coming here. Sometimes there's a little clues like that. Yeah, oh, I'll just add one thing real quick. Yeah, I think there's like some really interesting, like. Uh, large-scale uh, quantitative research that's been done on like, like I'm thinking of uh, Jennifer Pan's research on uh, censorship in China um, and Gary King and Margaret Roberts. Um, and they were able to do sentiment analysis looking at the kinds of social media content that gets censored in China. Um, and they found that it wasn't, uh, it wasn't content criticizing the government, it was content uh, encouraging collective action of any kind. Um, and so, I think those kind of tools are amazing. That's not the kind of research I do. What I have tended to focus on more is like looking at one piece of disinformation and seeing how it travels across the internet. And so like, for example, if you think about in uh, 2016, conspiracy theories about Hillary Clinton's health, there were all of these conspiracy theories that she was like on her deathbed or like had this brain tumor. Um, and those started kind of um, on, uh, far-right image boards like 4chan and 8chan um, and kind of stayed contained to them until there was this YouTuber who's affiliated with uh, Alex Jones's channel Infowars named uh, Paul Joseph Watson. He made a video about it and then that influence kind of amplified the story and made it go everywhere and you saw it kind of going running amok on Twitter um, and then you had Fox pick it up uh, and Tucker Carlson making content that was just kind of like asking questions, you know. Um, and then 
a week or two later, Hillary Clinton actually got sick at an event, and that story was primed to kind of have the, the right-leaning frame on it um, with all of these conspiracy theories. So, uh, you know, there's a bunch of different ways to look at the, the actual content of it, um, and, and I think you can get at different pieces of it, yeah. Thank you. My question would be more directed to the issue of neo-Nazism and white supremacy. I spent a year after Oklahoma covering the militia movement. And this is now a different phenomenon altogether. And I'm curious if you could dig deeper into how do you schematize what's happened since the election. I think back on 2008, 2009, when uh, Fox would deliberately go out and uh, blend with the resuscitated patriot movement and then essentially send their hosts out to Tea Party rallies all around the country. Uh, to, and, and that interaction between TV and, of course, you know, the major influencer of all, Mr. Trump, uh, how do you see that interacting and how do you phase it out since the election? How more sophisticated have they gotten? Because one can look at opinion polls about this stuff and see what the public opinion polls say about the, you know, to get a better sense of the metrics. But how do you guys see them moving forward since 2016? Because there's been a hell of a pushback against this stuff ever since the election, as we all know. Yeah, that's a really, it's a complicated and very interesting question. One thing that I've thought about um, a bit on this kind of sphere is that, I suppose in like neo-Nazi groups and white supremacy, it's based on this, uh, you know, us versus them mentality, but also kind of by this notion of, oh, our views are being censored. Um, they, people are, you know, speaking about minorities issues all the time, but not about uh, white issues. And that uh, kind of, duality has, uh, it's become easier to share and more attractive as platforms begin to crack down on extremist views. It kind of becomes a self-fulfilling cycle in the sense that anything that a platform or third party would do to uh, try and negate these viewpoints or conspiracy theories or schools of thought ends up actually uh, making it stronger. And especially as, I, I feel like over the last couple of years, uh, social media platforms in particular have had to step up their moderation game. And that has kind of fueled its own cycle because now these groups are in uh, platforms that are friendly just to them. They're at Gab, they're on 4chan, they're all together and banding together and uh, finding strength in numbers in a way that they didn't before when it was just you know, under the surface. Yeah, to that point, I think one trend in the past few years has been uh, building continual media savvy. So, you know, kind of the, the ultimate example of this was Richard Spencer, whose explicit goal was to kind of rebrand white nationalism so that people no longer associated it with uh, kind of militia movements and, and uh, terrorism. And he wanted to make it have kind of a suaver, uh, more, uh, he would call it like, opt you know, white nationalists talk about optics, and they're they're trying to appeal to a broader audience and make it seem like there's not violence uh, inherent in the movement. Um, and obviously, you know, time and again, the violence keeps coming through. Um, but the an advantage of that tactic for them is that they can kind of continue to get these ideas out in mainstream culture uh, without kind of having the same. Uh, I yeah stigma associated with it. All right, I think we have time for one last question up in the front. Um, so s because this is kind of like an arms race of sorts, I like I don't think that um, like better AI or a law that would take forever to pass uh, will solve it. There's no I don't think there's a magic bullet for this kind of thing. Um, so I I think that if the only real solution is for people to retreat from social media, and I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Um, so wh what do you guys see like 10, 20 years from now as this moment in time where this has become a big problem and everyone's talking about it? Like, What do you think we would be talking about, um, like, like I said, in 10 or 20 years' time if we've solved it? Like, what, what does solving this even look like? I have a suggestion. Just taking the lesson of uh, what happened in China, I think um, 
supporting real media, supporting journalism, so we don't have really a poor uh, diet in in uh, legacy media, and which drives all the users to social media. I think that's really that's really important because if for if China's news industry wasn't so crippled by uh, censorship. Um, Social media wouldn't have so much influence. Yeah, I think that there's no, I don't know, I think about this a lot very late at night. I'm like, there's really no solution to it. But I guess the only solution would be to neutralize it in a way if, say, people stopped putting as much trust in social media or started, gen if, like, in an ideal world, like 10 or 15 years from now, we'd be looking back and this, like, wow, remember when we believed everything we saw on the internet? But I don't think that that's really going to happen, perhaps because I'm a, pet, a bit of a cynic. But um, if we had, like, perhaps better media literacy, perhaps it's something built into the platform that kind of removes it from uh, the engagement metrics that make it more addicting and easier to kind of fall into these uh, echo chambers or some combination of the two. Yeah, and uh, yeah, along those lines, uh, in terms of things that platforms can do, I, I tend to focus on thinking about um, monetary structures and incentives and the unintended consequences of them. So I think this is like the entire ecosystem that I researched. You could say it's an unintended consequence of this system that YouTube promoted to try to get individuals to uh, be influential and, and monetize their platform. And uh, in some ways, the, the white supremacists on YouTube are manipulating uh, YouTube for, for unintended purposes. But in some ways, they're using it exactly as it was built to be used. And so kind of thinking through, OK, how are we encouraging people to use our platforms? And what are the, what are the unintended consequences of that? Thank you. Um, so thank you, panelists. This was great. And thank you all. Um, uh, the, uh, I don't know, the, Emily or George, did you want to have any closing remarks or? I'll do it because I'm closest uh, and George is slow. Um, so, so thank you very much indeed to all the panelists um, and thank you for coming out on a cold uh, Thursday night after Thanksgiving before the holidays, which I know is like you're giving up bar time. Um, so it, it, just a fascinating conversation. Thanks very much indeed to, for George and the team at Tao for organizing all of this. Um, and, you know, uh, I, ho I, 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 I fear that we're going to be discussing this for a long time. <laughs> uh, as Paris said, there really is no solution. Um, but that's why um, research centers like um, these and ours exist. So thank you very much indeed. And thank you, Mark. I should say.